Hello, everyone. Today I'm sitting here with my friend Ray Cronize. Ray is a former NASA scientist, and he is a co-founder of Zero Gravity. Ray is known for popularizing using mild cold stress as a tool for weight loss, and he recently did something completely crazy. He has just completed a 21-day medically supervised water fast. So what's up, Ray? How's it going? Well, technically I'm not done because I still haven't eaten. This is day 23. Uh, I did, did some other tests at the end, but uh, hopefully tomorrow or maybe the next day. So, I, you know, I feel so good. I don't know if I ever have to eat again, right? This is dietary restriction, right? Like to the extreme. <laughs> to I the mean, extreme. Is... Yeah, and, and, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, people, um, people believe that it's much more draconian than it is, and it is socially extreme. But it's probably not biologically extreme. You know, we can imagine that in our evolutionary past, there are periods of days or weeks that we didn't have food. And the fact that I feel perfectly normal, that, you know, we had some conversations earlier, you know, there's some things that slow down a little bit. It's not like you can do everything. You know, words don't come exactly as quickly. But for the most part, it doesn't feel any different than day one. And, um, and I, I think one of the reasons I adapt so quickly is because I mostly live a dietary restricted lifestyle when I'm not doing this. But... Uh, but anyway, it's, it's interesting that you don't feel hunger, you don't, I don't have headaches, I don't feel tired. I, you know, I just feel like normal me, it's just that food just isn't on, on the thing to do. So for us type A's that love to do stuff, you just work and do your thing and you don't have to stop to eat. What instigated you just to, to try out, out not eating for 21 days? Like what, what's your... Yeah, so, so going back, um, you know, part of my own personal problems was, you know, I, I, I had gained 80 pounds uh, during the time period of, uh, of, of when I was at NASA and leaving NASA and a company I had in between there uh, for about eight years. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was type 2 diabetic, basically. I had high cholesterol. I had issues. I lost my weight doing the cold stress, and everybody's read my story on that. And you know, it's in Tim Ferriss's uh, Four Hour Body and, and Ted Talk out, Ted Med Talk out there. But, even when I lost weight, um, all those things still didn't fix. So I actually had to start looking into diet. And I was exercising. I was doing the, you know, sort of a body for life plan, six meals a day, cardio, alternating with upper and bo lower body, you know. So, so six workouts a week. So it wasn't like I wasn't doing what they said, but it didn't fix the problems I had. So as I started digging deeper, about that time, the bow wave of press came with Tim's book. And of course, everybody looked at ice baths because Tim, in the, in the chapter, his supplements that he put in are all about ice baths. And of course, that's not what I was doing. I did some extreme stuff in the beginning to sort of understand, but I didn't, I, I wasn't focused on the ice baths. I was focused on my, just exposing my body to mild cold all the time. You know, I used to say gloves before sweater makes you look better. You know, just always making your body burn just a little bit more calories. And so um, in doing that and getting out there, everybody threw the BS flag. They're like, you know, you didn't really lose weight that way. The cold, you know, you, know, you burn more calories. They used to say, and you can find these articles, they used to say, you burn more calories getting hot. And it's just simply not true, but they, it, it was said. And so then started the myths. And because of the blog and people having questions, and I constantly get inundated with protein, carbs, and fat, I wanted to know how the calorie works. So fast forward a couple of years, I bought an indirect calorimeter. I had it in a lab built next to my kitchen, and I just started repeating all the classical experiments. Well, there's this whole body of literature that was done on fasting. And it's fascinating. And not only as a medical modality that they were actually getting better, things that get better at the facility I'm here. People are lowering their blood pressure dramatically, uh, dealing with diabetes, dealing with eczema. You know, I had a, a, a guy who was a sweet mate, Han, Hanro from South Africa, that was with me for a couple, you know, he was fasting, he was there for a couple of days, he's gone back, but, you know, fixed his eczema completely. So the idea that there's something there, that the body, when it gets in this really restrictive mode, starts to repair things, that's not so far-fetched. No, it's been shown. But, but it's so long ago, and how do you sell it? Like people say, well, you know, how do you sell sitting in a room drinking water? You know, it sounds crazy, but I think it's something we really need to rank at science. I think we need to look at the intersection of this. So starting uh, last year, I did a series of experiments where I was changing my diet over a six-week period. 
And what I was able to demonstrate is that I was actually able to lose body fat at about the same rate as when I was water fasting, which to me is pretty neat, you know, by just doing some simple changes. That's the kind of thing I used when, uh, when Penn Jillette lost his weight. Uh, but the point is, is that in seeing that I could function on so little, it, it seems like the basis where we start where your stuff then picks up, which is, okay, we get down to the space where we're not overnourished now. What things do we need to deal with? What other kind of supplements? What kind of things do we need so that we don't get the, you know, the dietary restriction with our malnutrition? How do we add that back? And now having experienced it, it seems like something that I, I, very, I, I think will be a part of my lifestyle for the rest of my life. So you getting to this dietary restriction without malnutrition, um, we have a lot to talk about with dietary restriction and its effects on, on the human physiology. But did you supplement with anything? Was this like, so this 21-day fast, you know, were there any vitamin, mineral supplements like right. along with that? No, and that's the surprising thing. I'll show you my nutrient panel. Even last day with 14 days, uh, uh, my, my vitamin D went up. Uh, didn't go down because I was in sunny California, lay in the sun. It was beautiful. Uh, none. Of, I wasn't deficient in anything. Every, all my blood panels turned out normal. Uh, on day seven, I did a around-the-clock amino acid pa uh, panel where I did all the amino acids and their, the several met metabolites that are in there. And, uh, and of course, they tracked with the circadian day, just like you've, you've talked about. They, they, they're not something that are fixed. This idea that we're eating protein and it's pumping in our blood, it's, it's always there. Um, but they do cycle with the day. Um, of course, things like alanine, which is mainly used for the gluconeogenesis, went through the roof. Mm -hmm. Lipids go through the roof. So there's some changes, certainly some physiological changes, but I wasn't deficient in anything. The idea that we have to have nutrition every day and this balanced meal, that's one of the things that I really want to challenge. Because I do think we need a comprehensive nutrient adequacy across the spectrum, but it's probably measured in days or weeks, not every single day. The, yeah. So um, in, in terms of like the micronutrients and certain micronutrients that are needed, you know, you're talking about B vitamins, vitamin K, selenium, zinc, magnesium. The question still remains like what is an adequate level? Because a lot of the RDAs that are set are set on, based off of animal studies that have been done that have shown that deficiency can cause death. And so like a couple standard deviations above that are what are considered right. what you need. Right. But the question is, and this is something that my mentor Bruce Ames has you know, proposed and put out there, and I know that you're familiar with, yeah. uh, something that he calls triage right. theory, and that is, well, there's all these enzymes and proteins that require some of these micronutrients as cofactors that are not essential for short-term survival. So if you, right. you're deficient in it, you know, it, it it doesn't matter right now because it's not needed right, right. now. It's right. needed for a long-term survival. It's needed to repair damage that's constantly happening. Right. It's needed to prevent things like cancer, Alzheimer's disease. So the question of deficiency in of itself, I think, needs to be challenged. I think we don't really know how much of these certain right. micronutrients we need to make sure DNA repair enzymes are working, to make sure our tumor suppressor genes are working, right. to make sure that all our antioxidant, right. our, you know, all those pathways that need these micronutrients are, are getting their cofactors you know, that right. they need to work optimally right. or you know, to at least be working as we're aging. Right. Um, so I think that's, um, if we look at something like a blood panel and we go, well, we're not deficient. Well, Based on what? Based on the short-term function? Based, right. We don't know, right? Well, yeah, but at the same time, we also don't know the consequences of overnutrition. You know, and we get a massive excess of a, of a biologically active compound that's and levels that we would never would have seen in nature. And we've seen it with vitamin E, we've seen it with vitamin D, we've seen it with some of the other ones. So the, the question is here, you know, first, you know, if we stop thinking about our diet as a daily thing, and start thinking it as a lifetime thing, then things change because there may be things that are very much something you do. I mean, you guys are in prime reproduction uh, time. So to get you know, fecundity to go up and be more fecund, we want to increase essential amino acids. We know that things like methionine, whatever, increase fecundity. At the same time where I am, which I'm done with that process at 51, you know, that we want to, I want to make sure that I have longevity. And they're also negatively 
associated with longevity. So, so you know, what I feel like where we are right now, the science and things that we can be doing in the next decade is taking this body of knowledge, and yes, we can start peeling the onion more and more and more and more mechanistically, and now we've spread that to all the blogs, and they're peeling the onion, but every now and then they you know, cut off and forget half of it. They just sort of put these technical words out there. But how do we bring it back to look at something more comprehensive? How do we look at health span? You know, before we lengthen life, we need to lengthen health span. And I'm saying that if we look at, if, if I'm not deficient, the, the average person thinks if they go without a meal, their metabolism is going to crash, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? So, and this will be the, I, I will finish with the micronutrients, but we'll go to the macronutrient, I mean the macro level. But if they think that by skipping a meal, something's going to happen or by, uh, by somehow not including some food group or something in every single meal, that somehow they're going to be deficient. Uh, you know, the ubiquitous, you know, my, my, you know, the evil words I've told you before, protein, carbs, and fat, I hate them. If you get on my blog, you'll see why. But, you know, no one's going to be deficient in protein, really. And if they're going to be deficient, it's going to be in one of nine amino acids, essential amino acids. We know what they are. And we've studied them quite a bit. And, you know, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that for the average person out there, we also know that those nine happen to be connected to longevity too. And no one's looking at that part. So my point is, looking at this more of a, as a spectrum. So originally we looked at diet because of the economics of food and the scarcity of food. If you don't have enough, it's great that every single thing meets a certain minimum, right? So when these rules of eating were developed, and we can look at some of those later, because uh, I have all those USDA guidelines from the turn of the century, which are just fascinating. Uh, because they actually said why they did it. And today they have different reasons, but they say the same thing. And that's kind of spooky to think about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've made up new reasons for the same explanations. Um, but anyway, if you look at what they said, if you think about it, the average person was spending 60% of their income on food. And when you're in a situation where you have a limited, if we look at this as a budget, budget thing, more people may relate to it. If you're at a budget and you're barely making enough each month, every dollar counts. But the, vo the value of $100 to me and a billionaire is still, is still $100. So the point is, is that every dollar counts the closer you get to what you're meeting your needs are. So this idea of balanced meals and balanced diets and balanced nutrition always being deficient came in a time when people really were deficient. Deficient, deficient, deficient enough to see the diseases that we've identified. Now, what you're their, saying... Their gums were falling out because right, they were getting scurvy. Right, right. Yeah. And, and where you're at, and, and I am too, is, okay, now in addition to that, not necessarily what are we deficient in, if I change the language and say, what more can we get at the micronutrient times, the phyto, the, all need? the phytochemicals to maximize and optimize our, our, our longevity? You know, there isn't any perfect diet. We're not designed to eat anything. We can eat everything, and that's why we spread everywhere. But I think somehow this construct of food and the construct of the balanced meal and the construct that it happens in a single setting versus spread out over days or weeks where I think the body is, it's much more rational to me to think that the body deals with it over days and weeks uh, and doesn't become deficient instantly. Um, I, I think that's where the, the, the tension needs to focus. And there's really no money right now to be made in that. I can't sell somebody something. I can't sell them more supplements. I can't sell them more training. I can't sell them more exercise. And so we, it's kind of a trap, but I think there's people like you and I that, and, and, and some of the collaborators I'm working with yours too, that are just intellectually curious about it. But we need to bring it back to whole food. We're getting to bring it back to food and say, what can we get out of what we have? And then what's left over to supplement? Right. So you were um, alluding a little bit to some of the, the studies on dietary restriction. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's important a lot, in science, dietary restriction doesn't, doesn't refer to the extreme type of restriction that you just underwent. Yeah. Can I make a real quick? Yeah. Let, me, let me explain how I tell people about this because um, before I started doing this research, the way I saw it was overnutrition, too much, normal diet, deficient, undernutrition. That's what was in my head. As I began to read a lot of that dietary restriction without malnutrition work, and I now always add that yeah. at the end, what I realize is probably what's more thing is there's overnutrition, which is actually a small bar because in nature, it's really hard to do that. But how do you separate overnutrition from 
being over be giving giving people you know getting too much of your amino acids, too much of your fatty acids, too much glucose without getting them right. But I'm just uh, let me talk right? the big at the big block level first. Overnutrition is a sort of a small little thing because in nature you don't really have it. Normal nutrition is what we would normally a normal healthy person would eat there. But then there's this all, all diet restricted without mal malnourishment, which I would say is a big block because that's human survival. We have to be able to survive periods of this, you know, up and down with the nutrition, and that's a big block. And interestingly, the things you and I are most interested in, the micronutrients, which are all coming from these leafy green plants, are actually abundant. You don't get much calories from them, but you can find them all the time. And then when they're stressed, xenohormesis, they may be actually giving us even more. So you got that. And then there's undernutrition. When I added this second, this, this extra block and said, so, you know, I call it the survival block. That block is a place where we likely lived and we likely survived, not optimally. We, you know, we don't have parasites. We don't have infectious disease. We don't have the things they were really battling. So we can maybe leverage that to live longer. So now back to what you were saying um, is I, I think that we don't know. I don't, I don't know that we know where that upper limit is, but I know that from a calorie perspective, and I hate to use that word too because it's misused a lot, and then there's people that even question it, and we can talk about that in a minute, but um, we certainly are overnourished from just a calorie density perspective. Absolutely. You know, we, we do are, and that's an, this is disease of affluence. We have so much disease of affluence. You can go to... Uh, countries that don't have access and they, they don't get the same disease. They get the wealth and China, India, and then they come with it. Well, what's so uh, interesting is that and ironic is that at the same time that we're overnourished, we are, according to you know a lot of these NHANES studies coming out, we are uh, getting inadequate levels of many of these micronutrients. Right. I think if you're, if you're overnourishing yourself that you then would have adequate levels of right. these micronutrients. But the thing is, people are eating the wrong foods. Right. They're eating the wrong foods. And so they're not getting all their folate, vitamin K, selenium. Right. They're not getting, you know, all these important micronutrients. And, and yet they're getting a lot of, you know, fatty acids, amino acids. They're getting a lot of the, the, yeah. the, the macronutrients. Macronutrients, like right. Call them. Yeah. Um, and, and it is, it is a big right. problem. You know, it's... It, it, yeah, and, and what we tried to do to address it, and we've got a series of papers coming out, but the metabolic winter hypothesis already there, and the food triangle, one of the reasons we do it, because uh, first of all, ideology aside, the sort of eat meat, don't eat meat debate is you know boring to me, and I never even go there. I know we talked about it that night. It just gets to be old. Um, so this isn't a, you know, it's not, it, it's not that. But it turns out animals are biologically very similar from a, from a, that's why we use them for models. They very, and plants are very fundamentally simple. And it just so happens that mostly animals, the, the energy that you get from animals is mostly fat. And the energy you get from plants is mostly dietary carbohydrate. And I don't want to then use, I, don't, I won't say carbohydrate again. And then from, except for nuts and seeds and avocados, things like that, that have a significant amount of fats. Uh, so, but when we look at it, when we draw this food triangle, you know, what we put at the top were the leafy greens, the cruciferous vegetables, stems like celery and, and, uh, and uh, asparagus, uh, mushrooms, uh, and bulbs. And we said, look, the vast majority of what you eat every day should come from the top of this thing. If you eat the majority of these food, the volume of food, if you just eat the volume of food, now you have a choice. If you eat down the left side, which would be kind of a paleo diet, uh, you can maintain your weight, but you won't get as much fiber, you won't get the extra phytonutrients, extra things that are over here, because you end up calorie displacing, energy displacing. If you start adding all this stuff, because as soon as you know you, you start adding this part over there, you start going over your energy limit, and now you still haven't gotten to where you and I want to get, which is enough of the micronutrients. On the other hand, when you add down the plant side, what's interesting is you get great things in fruits, you know, berries, nuts and seeds. I mean, every single issue of American Journal of Clinical Nutrition just about has a study on nuts and seeds and the flavonoids, the uh, carotenoids, all those things that are in nuts and seeds. Uh, you get um, legumes, right? le legumes, a big one. You know, I mean, that's a huge life. And you look at all the, the, the um, what is it, the blue, what is the book, the blue, blue zones. The blue zones. Yeah. You know, legumes are a big part of So that. let's, let, so this part of the, is it the right side of your? The right side of, of your tri triangle. Right. So it's plant, a lot of plants, nuts, yeah. and legumes, right? It's it, from, basically the bottom, the bottom of, the, of that side is 
is uh, pulses, legumes, I mean, um, cereals, pulses, which are legumes, starchy vegetables, fruits, and then to a, a small thing, which is nuts and seeds, which we separate just to distinguish the fat okay. content. Um, if you, if from an aging perspective, so, you know, a lot of people have different goals. My goal is to have a healthy and extend my health span. You mentioned mm -hmm. health span. And what that really means is to, you're not necessarily going to, you know, live to be 200. Right. But when you are 90 years old, you're going to be physically active, fit. You're going to be biologically you know, 20, 30 years younger, 40, right. 50 years younger. Most Your people, brain, don't, get, most people don't guess me at 51. Right. So the so. thing is, is that there's a chronological age right. and there's a biological exactly. age. And you want to be biologically younger. Like, who cares what your chronological exactly. age is? And the thing, to bring it back to the, the uh, legumes and plants and, and the nuts and seeds, is that if you look, a recent study has been published by this Japanese group where they looked at a variety of different biomarkers that are age-related. Mm -hmm. So they looked at, um, these scientists looked at telomere length, uh, you know, markers of senescence. They looked at hematopoiesis. They looked at, you know, glycolated hemoglobin, blood glucose levels, insulin sensitivity. And they looked at inflammatory cytokines, you know, biomarkers of inflammation, biomarkers of, you know, all the inflammatory pathways. And they looked at it in, in three different populations of people. The elderly, which were about 85 to 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Centenarians, which were, you know, 100 years old. Um, and then semi-centenarians, which are about, a, sorry, semi-super centenarians, right. which are like 105. Right. And then super centenarians, which were 110 up to 115. And to me, if you look at the average lifespan in the U.S., it's 79. So it's you know, right. close to 80. Well, if someone's, if they're, if we know right now that humans are physically capable of living to be 115 years old, that's almost, you can round up, 40 years longer right. lifespan. That's like a 50% increase in right. lifespan. That is huge that we're doing, that it's right now. No science fiction, right. no nanobots involved, right. no CRISPR, nothing. nothing. It's already designed in our biology exactly. that that's right. possible, right? And, and in some of those populations, some of them just are sort of outliers where they just live all. Mm -hmm. Some of them are fully functional. Exactly. Fully functional. Health span, yes. Yes, so they're fully, fully functional. Fully functional, cognitive, I mean, they're, yes. yeah. So my point is, is that the, the only biomarker that was identified to drive the aging process in all three categories, the elderly, centenarian, semi, or all four, uh, was inflammation. Right. Inflammation was inversely related to age yes. into longevity yep. and when you think about the human body and biology and physiology the number one driver of inflammation in humans in our bodies is the gut yes the gut is where we have the highest concentration of immune cells it's where we have the highest concentration of bacteria and when those two combine you get you get war firing away of right. cytokines and and that's the major right. source of all inflammation in yeah. our body right yep. there yep and what has been shown in you know countless studies, particularly over the last five years, is that the gut likes fiber. Absolutely. These, you know, it, and, and, and 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 not only that, but the gram-negative bacteria, the mm -hmm. fat-loving ones, mm -hmm. those are the ones that are usually the most inflammatory. And so, so when I I, I did a post on this a couple of years ago, and uh, I, I think there are two really big things that are going to end up coming out of. It. First of all, fecal transplants in our lifetime will actually, I think, be a part of aging. I think we will end up that just basically that microbiome keeping it right because of antibiotics, because of the things that we do in yeah. life that disrupt. You know, I usually tell people, you know, you send 12 Amish men to a rock concert, they can have a great message, get up on stage, but the environment's not conducive. And in, in that microbiome, they are what we eat. Their waste products go into our absorption organ. Yeah. And, and, and this is critical. And, you know, it's, it's not just because we've seen all the transplant studies we've done in mice. It's not just, just eating the food, but it's also having the right distribution down there. And all it takes is a little bit of wrong things. And then you get an explosion of something. Yeah. And it, it, so again, what's socially extreme may not be biologically extreme. The kinds of solutions we need to have for that and the kinds of fiber and food that what we want to do. On the right side of the food triangle, I guess I should say right for the audience, on the right side of the food triangle, 
all of those foods are we are going higher and higher and higher in fiber. Right. And yeah. it's, it's interesting that these different types of fiber, like the different types of yes. beans and the nuts, they're fueling different types of bacteria. And, these, and they make these byproducts that are literally regulating our immune system. They're regulating hematopoiesis. They're increasing the amount of, you know, T regulatory cells to regulate autoimmunity. They're decreasing, you know, all these immune cells that are firing away right. pro-inflammatory. So they're, they're regulating the inflammatory process. Uh, go, and all these little on. oligosaccharides. All those, feed them. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they're just crazy, all the things that are going on there. And yet, um, if, if you think about what we're doing is we're, first of all, we're deluging that you know, from the time we wake up in the morning until the time we go to bed, we're just always in the chronically fed state. And we weren't in the chronically fed state. And our next paper, one of the, the next paper that we're having, uh, it will talk about the implications of the chronically fed state. So, you know, this brings up what you talked earlier about is intermittent fasting. Yeah. And, and, you know, when I was looking at a lot of these, you know, again, I, my first twist of this was to look at a metabolic thing. So let's just like get met metabolism out of the way because this other stuff is a lot more interesting to me. Right. But, but just in terms of metabolism, everybody wants to think I need to increase my metabolism. I'm gonna eat this meal, it's gonna, I'm eating this protein shake, my metabolism is gonna rise. Well, it turns out I've not, met, I've not measured a single broken metabolism in three years in my lab. A hundred people, no one has a broken metabolism. Your metabolism scales with your mass pretty much. You know, Inside whatever size you are is your thin lean self. Give that thin leaf self the steel equivalent of what you lost and carry it around all day, and that's what happens. But what's really interesting is that now on the extreme side, so I could say all this in terms of food, but when I was dieting, even doing extreme dieting by everybody else, it's just a very low calorie diet. Days is right? extreme. Well, I'm just saying before even that, just, just in the things that I do where people will lose weight rapidly with me, most people that I work with lose weight 0.6 to 0.8 pounds of fat a day. And that's without exercise. Is that the with exercise, cold? No. No cold? No. Cold is part of it, but it's not part of it in the way you're cold. thinking of it. Okay. Okay. So I use it as an junk therapy, but it's not to increase the metabolism. We'll talk about cold yeah. later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, so basically, though, what's interesting is, is that, you know, in all the different regimes, my metabolism always tracks with the Francis Benedict equation. And when we go back later, I'll show you. I've got the 1918 study. I show you. I have all their data. The point is, those guys did this research, and what they did is right. And what we've done today is we have popularized these words. And you know, I I literally have debates with people about metabolism. Can you define what you what okay. you mean by so I'm talking metabolism. about? Yeah. So so what I'm talking about is the net sum of respiration of all your cells. So. Uh, the way we measure metabolism is we measure the carbon dioxide that's hailed, exhaled, breath by breath, and the oxygen that goes in, and then the oxygen comes out. So we know delta oxygen, and we know the carbon dioxide. And so the ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen is called the respiratory quotient, or RQ. Um, it tells us, like a thumbprint, what fuel we're burning. So if you look at this general stoichiometry, like the combustion of ethanol, ethanol plus oxygen equals CO2 plus water. And you do the balance equation like you did, you'll see that you know you get a, 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 a three on one side, two on the other, or two on the one side, three on the other, and you do the you, or no, two and then three, and you get the respiratory quotient of 0.67. Okay. So that is, that's a number. So if I'm mainly metabolizing alcohol, my respiratory quotient will pu push down. Uh, carbohydrates of all times, doesn't matter what kind they are, all of the glucose, anything that's dropping in there, those have a respiratory quotient of about one. And then fats or lipids all around between 0.69 and 0.7. So what's really interesting is that, uh, and, and amino acids, they average 0.84 if I average all of them. And so proteins are kind of a mixture. One protein might be a slightly lower, slightly higher, but they average 0.84, which is great because the only way we measure protein is not through the carbohydrate because by that time, the deaminations happen. You've lost all that energy through the urea, and it looks like sugar coming out otherwise, right? But what we can do with protein is we collect the urine, which is why I'm carrying an orange jug around all day. <laughs> Too much information, but you know, it's science, right? So, uh, so we get the nitrogen from the urine, mm -hmm. and then we can back out. But by knowing the carbon dioxide produced and the oxygen, we can see the ratio of glycogen to fat burn. Real and time. And you're saying that you have not seen someone's metabolism that's been broken. 
Meaning, meaning they're at their, their, metabolic, their metabolic rate, which would be like speed of the car, is what all the industries focused on. Everybody wants to increase their metabolic rate. And what I'm saying is how fast you're going only matters if you're headed in the right direction. You need a compass too. And RQ is kind of the compass. It is the, it is the, um, is the, the indicator. Am I burning mainly carbohydrate or am I burning mainly flat? You can run your ass off for hours. And if you're only burning carbohydrate, you just get on the glycogen treadmill. And so then what people do to counter that is they say, oh, I'm going to remove all the carbohydrate and shift my body into ketosis. So I'm burning fat all the time so that when they're running, they are burning fat. But again, it's not necessary because it turns out when we get, when we become more restrictive, your body's smart. And when we become more restricted, you naturally start shifting to more and more and more fat because your body knows to serve glucose, to conserve it. It wants to. So where I'm going with metabolism is that all the discussions we have about metabolism, about boosting metabolism, about all these things, even cold stress, uh, a lot of them fall into the that simple thing I said earlier, which is we used to we used to eat to support our activity because food was rare, and today we're active to support our even, eating. And the more simple thing is you can't out exercise your mouth. It's impossible. It's thermodynamically impossible. You can swallow way more than you can move. It's just not. So why it's talking about metabolism, what I'm saying about not being broken is you don't have a slow metabolism. That's not your problem. It's not that you have a slow metabolism. Now you got to go get hormones to speed up your metabolism that nobody, by the way, ever measured. Isn't it amazing? All these people talk about metabolism and they don't measure. And so that was what I started to say earlier was I have these debates and I say, well, you know, how many metabolisms have you measured? Do you know anybody who's measured a metabolism? Have you ever touched anybody that's measured metabolism? And the answer is most people never made it. And I hadn't. I was talking about metabolism. I was guilty of all the same stuff. I'm, you know, but once I started measuring it every day, and when we measure years later, you're going to find it's way more dynamic than you think it is. It's way, and then, I mean, because you are very precise about the things you want to know, this one's really going to mess with you because <laughs> okay. it's not what we think. So this boosting the metabolism, we're going to boost metabolism. Now, cold stress. We'll come back to it when we talk about cold stress because there's some really specific things on cold stress and some really specific numbers that I can give you or, or I can show you some things that I've done with cold stress, which is kind of interesting because it turns out mild cold stress naturally tends to lower your RQ, meaning shifting towards fat. Um, so, and we'll talk about that when we get to that. But just to sum up metabolism, we're not broken. And that's you know one of the things I'm gonna to try to talk about in our book in more common language is say, look, we're not broken. Let's not start with that. You know, let's start with the food we're eating and the social environment of why we eat. And, and then superimposed on top of that, my, you know, my benign conspiracy, or I could say our benign conspiracy, <laughs> which is I really wanted people to shift more towards health span eating. Mm -hmm. I want them to shift more towards a kind of, of diet that would promote health span because it's, it's really embarrassing that the community we run with and we know all the people we're talking about and the community we were run with that are talking about longevity and talking about all this stuff and they aren't eating well. And if we can't, like, we know this stuff works. Like you said, we know it works now. We don't even, we just have to do it. Well, who doesn't want to, you know, live a healthier life and be younger when they're older? I mean, right. who doesn't, you know, want to, you know, not be, crippled and, and right. degenerated. Arthritis. And, yeah, who wants to heart that? Heart disease, Pain, diabetes. Suffering, I mean, all that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like, I think that the, that eating to increase your health span, I think yeah. it is my goal. And, you know, I think that it is a lot of people's goals, even, even if they don't realize right. it. Right. Even if they and, don't realize and, it. And, and so the one twist, what I would say, the pause that I think we should do now to think about just a little bit is I think my vision of doing what we're talking about before was about slugging how much stuff that I could get in my body that was helpful. And now I'm not so sure that's right. Now I'm not so sure that, that, that in, in doing so, I might unintentionally be overnourishing things 
that I really don't need to. So let me talk in my specific diet. Since for me, animal products are rare and appropriate. So what I mean by rare and appropriate is, um, is it's people and places. It's not um, how often I eat something. So I'm not the person that says, you know, I'm going to have sushi every two weeks or I'm going to have whatever. It's, it's people and places. Uh, so for example, with sushi, you know, something I, I absolutely loved before. Now, if I eat it too often now, my diabetes comes back. You know, hate to ruin everybody's party. It may not happen for everybody, but I know because, you know, I, I have a, a continuous glucose monitor. We, I seen, know exactly what it data. is. Yeah, so, you know, it's like right here. I know exactly what my blood glucose is yeah. at any minute. And so I, I know what it is and I know that it comes back. Uh, and so, and so um, you know, but my son, my son really loves to eat sushi. You know, so for me, you know, if he wants to go, and we'll go do that, you know, because I don't tell my kids how to eat. They mostly eat like me, but, you know, they eat whatever they want. And we'll go. I'll have a, a big old rice or I'll have something before, you know, that fills me up. Then maybe I have a couple of pieces. But we're having fun. We're enjoying that stuff. I don't go pig out on sushi. I just don't do that anymore. Or I, we make our own. So I make all the sushi that I do with mushrooms and lots of other things, which they love just as much, especially because you can eat as much as you want, you know. And Bill's great, you know, so it's inexpensive. I shop at the Asian store. So anyway, back to the food triangle. Um, you know, I, I eat on the I eat on the right side of the food triangle, and you know, I get nuts, seeds, and avocados often, um, and uh, I eat lots of fruits. I have fruits around all the time. I'm not glucophobic, you know, like all these people think it's sugar, sugar, sugar. Well, you know, I don't eat refined sugars, you know, but I eat that. If I want to sweeten something, I use a date. But what's really interesting is that as my diet has changed, my palate and my taste acuity has changed immensely. And, uh, you know, recently, Penn Jillette's been posting on Facebook, uh, and he's, you know, said, you know, he says, for, first he was saying I ruined him, and somebody correct him said I fixed him. But now, even in eight months' time, he's eating these things, like making this big blowout for, for show, and he's not enjoying it as much as it. I just don't enjoy those things anymore, so, as much as I did. So I get those things, but what I'm not doing is I'm not doing the all day eating thing. So I don't start with a smoothie and do this and do this and do this. I tend to compress my eating window. So I'm kind of naturally doing alternate day fasting or every other day eating or intermittent fasting because I'm just decreasing my meal frequency. And I eat a lot of food. I, you would not believe how much I'll eat. And that's why a lot of people say, oh yeah, I went vegan and, and, I, and everything started happening. Well, you know, most people just don't eat enough food. You know, clearly we can live off this. Our primate cousins are fine. So that, you know, there's not a debate there. And if you're eating junk food, you know, the worst place to try to eat healthy food is a vegan restaurant because they basically just shake sugar, salt, and flat, fat and put it on plants. Like the Western diets take sugar, salt, and fat and throw it on, you know, meat and stuff. You know, meat is the delivery system for sauce. You know, what it really comes down to it. So, Anyway, when I'm eating on that right side, what I try to do is, is decrease the frequency. And that's where I think it's kind of neat because I do think, you know, blending, for example, not juicing, but blending, and I know you're an advocate yeah, too. You need the fiber. I, I, think, um, I think, well, I get tons of fiber in my diet because I eat an enormous, enormous amount. But I think blending certainly ruptures the cells, mm -hmm. certainly get more access. There's some studies, I think we need to do more on that. Um, where I'm excited is like this summer, I did all hydroponics. Yeah, I grew all my greens, and, uh, and I'll show you some of the pictures, but, but two weeks from seeds to harvest. I use this, the, the vertical earth garden. It's an amazing thing, and, and I'm growing. But where I think, what if we start stressing these plants and going to that next level? Right. Just going beyond even that. So we need to probably explain a little bit of that, but yeah. first I want to ask you, when, okay. with your intermittent fasting, do you usually eat in the mornings, like evenings? When, when do you actually take in most of your food? Um, I tend to, I'm not a morning person. I've never eaten in the morning. I, I get up early. My best thinking time is between, they say, 4 a.m. To, to 9 a.m. That's where I can really do. Um, I taught myself a year and a half ago to sleep. I never could go back to sleep my whole life. So I don't, I don't there's not very many times that I slept past seven in my entire life. I'm like, even if I go to bed late, boom, I, my circadian yeah. it's hard to get up. But... I taught myself how to go back to sleep. So I've been trying to sleep, so I'm getting, like I'm averaging right now, um, I'm averaging, you know, uh, eight, nine hours. Um, 
eight, eight or nine hours of sleep. Um, so are you tracking your sleep? Yeah, like my, I'm, I'm tracking my sleeps. I'm tracking my sleep. So is this like your own thing or is this, no, like this, this is the withings app. This is the withings aura. So, uh, I have a whole suite of withings things. They have the aura that measures, measures your sleep, the scale, Can which you spell that, the, uh, withings, uh, W I T H I N G S okay. withings. And they have the sleep and this active, this or uh, active E or whatever the pop, this, this guy, uh, measures sleep too. So I have that, I have a, you know, you, they have a camera that measures VOC, your scale measures CO2. So it's sort of, oh, cool. it's sort of interesting because it maps your environment, what kind of environment you're in. But uh, I'm now sleeping way better. Um, and we talked a little bit on your, your Facebook page about melatonin. We can get to that in a second too. But, but so, so um, I tend to eat in the evening okay. uh, or in the afternoon. And I, I, you know, because I'm working out of my house, it's just when. So one of the things that I try to teach the people I work with is don't name a meal. Technically, the first meal of the name, meal is break fast. I'm going to break fast tomorrow, and it's going to taste really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, and then I don't need you know, me, naming meals is convenient for restaurants so they know what to serve you. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's not time of day eating and there's not time of day foods. It doesn't matter what you eat, where you are, whatever. This idea that you're fueling your body for the day, just not true. Well, the one aspect that I think, you know, I, I think that is important and that has to do with the circadian rhythm. So right. in the morning, you are the most insulin sensitive in the morning. You know, so these the, the way our metabolic enzymes, they're going on a rhythm. Yes. So there is that component. Right. And the reason I'm sort of interested in it is because I also will practice intermittent fasting. And I'd like to talk about the aging aspects yeah. of that. But um, it. You know, you, it used to be that I was fasting the day and that I'd eat at night. And that's right. mostly because my husband, Dan, can't sleep. If right. he doesn't eat something before right. bed, it was like, right. he can't sleep, he's hungry. Right. And, you know, there's, there's some truth to like that, that, right? Yeah, no, there's some people that like that. Yeah, well, recently we were traveling in Europe for a while and um, we were doing Airbnbs. And so, we're like, we wouldn't have any food. Like, so, you know, if we were eating, we would eat, like, you know, mid to late afternoon, like three or four, the latest. And that was it. So like then I was done and didn't eat you know anything until the next day. Mm -hmm. And I what I found is that I really felt really good doing that, which yeah. was the opposite. So I started not eating like right before bed, you know, where whereas that's what I was you know, doing originally. So, so to back that up, talk about glucose. Um, if you're uh, if you're um, eating starches in the evening, instead of getting those sharp peaks that you saw today, and the sharp people like this you'll get tailing. So th this is true. I mean, there's no doubt that you'll get tailing. The, the, the glucose doesn't clear as fast the later in the evening. No, that's so true. I'm not talking about night. I'm talking about like, I'll, I may eat it two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, okay. And then maybe I'll eat it five or six or seven. You know, so I'm not, I'm not a late, not I like don't a eat a late, PM. no, no, I don't uh, do but that. That's what's so dangerous like, about, you know, a lot of people. And there were times when I, you know, I'm working late and I don't get home until, you know, 8 p.m. or 8.30, and then it's like, then I have to cook, and then dinner's not ready until 9.30, right. and it's like, that's too late. And I have yeah. a weapon because I have this third option. Don't, Don't eat. eat. <laughs> and, that, and once I freed myself, I've been on a business trip for two days and came all the way home, and the only thing I had from the time I left to the time I came home was water. Yeah. I actually and that do. seems radical, but having that option is a tool in our toolkit. It is radical, but I, I agree with you. It doesn't have to be two days. It can just right. be that night for some people. And I do think that, you know, I know, I know several people that are late night eaters. They'll eat, they'll not eat in the morning because they're so busy and they have work, work, work. And it's not until, you know, later in the evening and then it, they end up eating around 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, you're the most insulin resistant at 10 o'clock at night. Right. And then it's like they have problems with, you know, metabolism problems and weight loss and all these things. And I, and I think that it's just, it's not healthy just based on what we know from circadian right. rhythm, just right. based on that alone. We know that that's like the time you're not supposed to eat. Right. You're not supposed to get all this like glucose right. and I, fat, I, I can't, everything. I can't know? wait to see our paper because we got some other explanations that, that will go right oh, cool. along with this. Cool. That will actually, it, it will superimpose well with us. And, and I completely agree. Um, so but, let's let's. I'd love if we, if you if you would like to uh, talk a little bit about 
um, caloric restriction or dietary restriction, which right. is what we now call it, and intermittent fasting. And like, right. you know, I've seen some studies comparing the two um, in terms of longevity and how mm-hmm. there's similar effects um, in almost every respect, you know, in terms of the me- metabolic effects, right. glucose metabolism, in terms of brain atrophy, brain aging, right. multi organ aging, all being delayed. Um, the one difference that was found in, in this paper, and I forgot which group it was that did this, and it's pretty recent, was that when they challenged the brain with like a neuro, some sort of neurotoxin that caused neuronal cell death, um, the, the intermittent fasting was protected, but the caloric right. restricted or dietary restricted was not. Mm-hmm. And they hypothesized right. with the ketone body, but, whatever. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, and I like haven't that. got into the, that part. So this is sort of, this is the, what I'm doing right now is my lead in. My, my point was... Uh, first, when we start with the idea of fasting and expand it beyond what you do to take a blood test. In other words, this yeah. idea that we're, quote, fasting every night, this is not where I'm going. So, so when we start the fact that here I am at 23 days and I'm fully functional, I don't feel bad. You guys have been with me running upstairs, you know, doing a stuff. It's having not, this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's fine. I, I mean, it is. It, it, you do get a little foggy at some point. So yeah. you, you're not as on top of things, like I told you earlier, words are, are more difficult, just it's kind of kind of interesting, certain things. But if we start from this basis that during this time, we have these amazing healing processes that happen. What I was telling you about blood pressure, 30 point drops in blood pressures in, in a matter of weeks, uh, you know, uh, people with eczema and all those things that are different. So we have these amazing repair processes that are happening in the fasted state. You know, we fast forward- can we, t- can we talk about why that is? I mean, that's been shown mechanistically in animal sure. models. And in monkeys, mice, monkeys, it's been shown that when you fast, it is a mild stress on the body. Yep. You had alluded hormesis. to the hormesis. Um, and that causes massive changes in gene expression. Right. And many genes are increased that are involved in dealing with damage, yes. repairing damage, anti-inflammatory. Yeah. All that stuff you know, right. being turned on. Right. Go, 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 go. And the body starts sequestering the things that it needs. You know, the popular myth is... Oh, your body's fasting. It's going to hold on to fat. No, it's not. That's your that's your storage organ. It's going to use the fat. Use but but the point is, is that for the stuff we're interested in, you know, your body starts m- m- mobilizing. It starts cleaning house. You know, metabolically cleaning yes, house. Going does. in, saying, "Here's a dysfunctional cell. I need these. I need these resources. Need this. Need this. Just like what you do when you're you're trying to make things. That you rob around. Which is really, really, really good because. Those dysfunctional cells, as you call them, they're often senescent, yes. which means they're not dead, they're not alive, they're sitting around, and what, what are they doing? They're secreting the hormones. <laughs> yeah, they're making more, they're damaging cell, right, cells right, nearby. Right. So if you can do something to get rid of that crap, you right. better do it. And right. fasting, intermittent fasting, yep. has been shown to do it. Right. So, so, so if, we, if, we, if we would get rid of the fasting term, meaning the overnight thing. Right, so we lose that. We go to this extreme and say, you know, look, the longest medically supervised water fast was 382 days, and that 382 days, yeah, 382, 276 pounds, 382 days. I'll send you the paper. Actually, I might have even posted it up on your thing, but it's 382 days, medically in the middle Sup- four, supplements or anything. No, just, it, just yes, water. Yeah, they did a multivitamin, Multiple. and then in the middle 49 days, they had to do some electrolytes. But other than that, he was fine. And he weighed 185 when he was done. What did and he start? What was his starting weight? To, uh, well, he lost 276 pounds. Okay, so we had a lot of fat to burn. Yeah, absolutely. He had the okay. energy. Right, right. <laughs> That's important, right? Yeah. No, he's not. If a, I were to do 308, yeah. I, I think I'd I don't know. There's some, probably some breatharians down the street that would disagree with us, right? <laughs> no, so the point is, is that, uh, so, so th- th- uh, that is, is, but when you say it's extreme, what's interesting is, there's no reason I couldn't, other than I don't want to get much thinner, mm-hmm. you know? Other than that, there's no reason why I couldn't go on and on and on at this point. I, the idea that somehow fasting is miserable was because people are responding to regularly dosing their body with meals and any anticipatory habit, habitual stuff that's going on. And what do they get? There's th- symptoms of hunger or headache, lethargy, lack of focus, irritability. What happens when you give up cigarettes? Lack of focus, irritability, headache, shaky, I mean, heroin, alcohol. And I'm not saying that food is addictive in that way. I'm saying the body only knows to withdraw when you're regularly dosing it all the time with stuff. So all of what you feel, what you feel now as hunger, really isn't hunger. Like right now, I'm hungry. And the only real symptom of hungry, you know, when I say that, 
is that my mouth will water and right now food would taste so freaking good you wouldn't believe it. Like I go to cooking classes at, you know, they have cooking classes. You would say, you go sit in cooking classes while you're fasting? Yes, because a lot of taste is smell. And surprisingly, my friend Richard Ross, uh, he was one of my clients, he's an amazing, uh, he's a cephalopod uh, a scientist at the uh, museum in, in San Francisco. Um, what's amazing is you can just smell food and believe me, it's almost as if you ate it. It's crazy. I, I can't, you, you know, I can't, it's like I can't Smelling tell you. food is good. Yeah, I, I can't like, tell you, but I mean, it's really intense. It's like something you've not experienced before. At like this when point. you don't eat yeah, and you just like smell you it. Smell, I and, it's, and, and it's almost like you taste it, it's whatever, but it doesn't send you into any crazy feeling because you're in a perfectly normal state. The body shouldn't, you know, these, these symptoms are not a way a starving animal finds food. You got to be clear. You got to be lucid. You got to yeah, go find food. Right, right. So, so okay. Getting back to that, the well, senescence. Can I ask you a question? Okay, Did any yeah. of your friends join you? Like, was this like something that other people that are well, also yeah, starving? The people, food? all the all the fast. Has anyone people. ever just like gone crazy and started <laughs> eating? Like? No, it's you don't have those urges. That's the okay. point. That's a myth about what it is because what people's idea of hunger, and what people's idea of eating is, is based on an idea that their entire life they've never been more than ten or fifteen hours without food. So first we had to dispel the myth that the fasting, which is this overnight fasting, which is, you know, has its a point, as you say, hormonally has its point. One of the reasons eating late is a problem is because then, you know, you eat, you go all the way into the night, and then you get up in the morning and you drink your shake right before you go to work out, and now you got, what, four hours a day fasting. And if all this important cleanup activity has happened during this downstate, you know, it's like taking amphetamines all the time and staying away just because you can well, the brain needs that time. It doesn't shut down. And meta it, you know, it doesn't go metabolic. Brain activity doesn't go away. It just changes. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is our body is somewhat, I feel this body is somewhat the same way. So now if I start from this basis, say here I am uh, at 23 days, I'm doing okay. Now I start compressing that window. And so, okay, now where do we get where those health benefits start kicking in? You know, some of dinner, you know, intermittent fasting yes. is some of it. Some of it, dietary restriction. So you could dietary restrict and be chronically fed. What do you mean by that? You could be eating all day long, very small amounts, and by a calorie perspective, oh, which is why I don't right. like calling it calorie restriction anymore. I'm right. going to start. Dietary restriction. You could be dietary restricted, but in the chronically fed state. Mm -hmm. Because postprandial, metabolically, we change. Yeah, and, and SIR T1 gets activated right. every time you're making, so when you're eating anything, you know, when you're eating food, you're going to make NADH, which is right. going to shut off SIR T1, right. which is also part of the, you know, benefits of so, fasting. So feeding frequency, when we look at feeding frequency, and that may be a reason, and I, I, we, we can look at this, if you look at the study with that lens and say, okay, how did they feed them? If they did the standard three meals a day, which was just made up, I'll show you the document of where it was talked about. In fact, we'll, we'll, Wait, we'll what see. what are we talking about? Who? The, 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 I, I'm talking about what happened 100 years ago okay. when we started. You know, Hippocrates questioned whether we should eat once or twice a day. He said some was to habit, some was to season, some was to age, and some was to, uh, to, uh, to country, you know, where you lived. In other words, you know, people were eating once or twice a day. They just didn't have a lot of food. Right. They didn't shut down the pyramids three diet times a day to feed those guys, you know? They said chisel, you know, yeah. pull the rope, here's some water, and then they give them some bread later, you know? And they managed to do something that we can't do today, right? So, so uh, alien, all alien theories aside, right? So, um, so, so basically what I'm saying is, is that, you know, we have this template that fits around first the agricultural s cycle, which I grew up on a farm. So eat a small little something in the morning before you go out, Stop early in the early 11 o'clock, have the biggest meal then while the sun's out, and then it's a long day, you go there, and it's a light meal towards the evening, and that's where this thing, three meals a day. Now for the workforce, it's eat before you go to work, have a break, have something to eat then, go eat lunch, you know, now we break, go have happy hour, go home, eat again, and then your you know, late nighters are obviously even worse, you know, go get the round of ice cream before you go to bed or whatever. That's a chronically fed state. What I'm saying is you could be in a chronically fed state and still have just a little bit of calories. You know, mm -hmm. you, you might lose body fat. I'm not saying you won't, won't be at a deficit. What I'm saying is this idea that you're always slugging. Every time we slug, we activate a whole set of hormones and react. Mm -hmm. and, and so 
we talk about fasting when we talk about and we talk about intermittent fasting the idea that you're really going long periods but even in the popular media because everyone's terrified to say don't eat you know you'll be anorexic or whatever you'll have an eating disorder but the idea that you can last a day or two i mean really i mean anybody tells me it's like you know they they're experts and they say you can't you know, use bad for your metabolism. Like, how many days have you been without food? Right. Like, exactly. Well, this is a question I've been trying to answer for myself, and that is, what, what's the minimal time that I need to fast to get the autophagy benefit? So right. autophagy is clearing away those damaged right. cells we were talking about. Um, and, and there's other benefits. So there's, act, you know, lowering IGF-1. You know, there's the SIRT activation. That stuff... Sure, T can happen yeah. quickly. I mean, so as soon just, as you're NAD. Just to give you an idea, my last fast, although it was, I did it over, um, my IGF-1 went down to 69. At the end, I was at 69. This one was really interesting. I started at 200. So the gaining the weight and eating, oh, right. and I ate helpful things to gain the weight, but I did stuff to get up there. Right. And I was massively eating two or three days before because I really wanted to have a negative experience with fasting. I, I really wanted to really set off the hunger pangs because I've seen people that have dealt with that. Most of them don't eat my diet before they fast. And the people that don't eat like me, they're really sick. I mean, they, they don't do so well. So I wanted to try to do that. So for about four or five days before, now I didn't really gain weight during that period because I was eating the kind, my food, it's really hard to gain weight on. Um, but um, so I was done with the weight loss. I'd already gotten up to my weight to start and I held it for about a month or so. And then two or three days before I started the fast, um, I, you know, I just started eating three meals a day, you know, healthy food, but just really eating a lot of volume of it. And my IG of us surprisingly- Do you eat like, a lot for, of meat? No, I don't eat any meat. I and your IGF-1 still went up? Yeah, still went up. Huh. Yeah, so, um, you know, zero. You know, I had uh, I had none. I mean, I had, you know, it was just all whatever. And it was up at 200. And then by the midpoint, it was already down to 100. So it dropped 100 points in seven days wow. or, or 10 days. And we'll see what it is. I already did the last one. The res results will be back soon. We'll see what the ending is. Last time, I, like I said, I ended at 69. So, uh, but anyway, why I'm saying that is because you know, I haven't seen a lot of work out there on this, but I think there might be data that we could tease out of papers that exist. It's something I want to think about as a sort of a next step, which is, you know, this meal frequency. You know, how often we're eating could be a huge problem. I mean, just frequency. And, and unfortunately, we're, it's the social. You and I, as scientists, are able to sort of ignore the, the social, if we think we're wanting to do something, we get headstrong, you know, we're going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And you just don't care what people say, and neither do I. Uh, but that, a lot of people out there, they're eating primarily for social entertainment. That's the only reason they're eating. They think they're eating for health, but even the ones in a lot of the fitness thing, they're just, they're socially doing what all of their crowd is doing, right? And even with us, I don't think we know enough yet to really optimize. I think we did a, re a relatively good job of creating a simple roadmap with the food triangle. So I think it helps from that perspective. We can say eat right. We can say if you're a bottom feeder, which would be meat and potatoes, pasta and meat sauce, fish and chips, burger and fries. That's the most energy dense diet you have and is it surprising everybody gains weight. Now, the fat people blame the carbs and the carb people blame the fat and they're both wrong for the right reason. They're both right for the wrong reason which I, that will be explained in our paper. But that food triangle becomes a roadmap. And then the question is, how can we optimize eating frequency? Because I want to maximize my body's chance to, to do this. And obviously, I could have fasted and supplemented. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. Although, at what level of supplementation do you interfere with one of those other systems, right? So we don't know that. But right. I think there are things we should be doing. But because there isn't a economic endpoint, it's a health endpoint, us getting the funding to do that sort of thing becomes problematic. That would be an interesting study. I like to see yeah. the, the, the meal frequency. I've seen, you know, I've looked at a lot of studies on intermittent fasting, dietary restriction in humans and, right. you know, finally figuring out like why a lot of the data wasn't being re replicated in humans that was found in monkeys and mice. And then they figured out humans when they're dietary restricted tend to eat more protein because it's more satiating. and. And then you're like, oh, so then their IGF-1 levels were going high. and you know, But eventually right. those things were sort of teased out. Um, right, but even down the satiation. Yeah. Okay, so that's a made-up word. And, it, and 
the entire context of that word is, in, is used in talking to people in a chronically fed state. I'm satiated. Yes, you are. Right. So, so, so what I'm saying is if we're going to change the language, we have to fundamentally, dis, as scientists especially, we have to disengage from all those studies. They're all polluted. It's like today, if I'm going to do a cholesterol study, I can't because there's nobody out there that it has the issues that are on statins. The ones we did before are about the best we're going to do because we can't do a randomized control and put one put someone and say, just don't do what you're doing and, and the other guys do this. So we've polluted the data set. All of the studies are, you, are varying protein, carbs, and fat, a thing that I want to get rid of. Well, you, okay, so I'm going to hold protein constant at 12%. And so in order to do that, what am I going to do? I'm going to study sugar versus oil. Okay, what have you just learned? Nothing. Because if I add a whole food starch, I screw up my protein number. If I add legumes, I screw up my protein number. Mm-hmm. If I add any of the things that I would actually really eat, I screw it up. You know, on the fat side, okay, you add, add, add lots of meat, you're screwing up your protein number, whatever. So what, we, what, we're, what everyone's arguing about, the sugar versus fat crowd, the whole crowd, if you really look at the papers, it's pretty easy to see. They're basically arguing of that. And you can look at any arm of the study. It's really a simple thing to just look at a study and say, you know what, I'm not going to even think about this. Look at the carbohydrate arm. And you need to see two things. First, did the fat go down? Not these goofy studies where a low-fat diet is 40% and say, oh, well, yeah, that's what they ended up eating. Well, no. You, if you're going to control it, control it. You and I can't say, well, you know, we were, we were aiming it to get, you know, 4 millimolar, but, you know, the ta- lab tech just couldn't get it right and got it at 20 millimolar, and so, therefore, you know, we're just going to go with that and still call it a study. It's just ridiculous what, what gets out there and published. But... If we look at it on the carbohydrate arm, always, you'll see a rise in the carbohydrate arm and you won't see an increase in fiber. And if you don't see increase in fiber, that means they added refined sugars. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And it means that it's just, it's compared to what you and I eat, it's an irrelevant study. I don't really, I mean, we don't need to debate sugar versus fat anymore. It's irrelevant because I don't eat oils nor do I eat sugar because I don't use the energy without the food. So all, of, food all, of my, with- all of my foods, all of my dietary sugars, all my dietary starches, all my dietary uh, fats are all come from whole foods. So, for example, if I didn't have the word, if we could eradicate the word carbohydrate from the diet, just that one, think about it for a second. If I don't have the word carbohydrate, I can't equate a whole food starch with a refined sugar. Mm-hmm. There's no way to connect. I can't, I can't equate a carbohydrate to cotton, also a carbohydrate. I, I always say refined carbohydrates. Yeah, but even if you say that, you're still, you're still not say, specific. I, this is a carbohydrate. Uh, wood, the wood floor is a carbohydrate. Termites eat wood, moss eat shirts, cotton linens. You know. The, so what I'm saying is these are all carbs. Chitin in crab shells, carbohydrate. So it's what a I'm vague saying, term. Yeah, huh? it's not very so, so it doesn't mean really anything. Then we've got to start saying complex carbohydrate. What the hell? Now we're just making the language. This is nutritionism. We're confusing it. We're confusing it. it. And more. yet, when if you do a study and say, I added potatoes and this is what happened. I added beef and this is what happened. You know? Instead of a protein source. Yeah. You know, because for most... I added Twinkies. Yeah, this, this is, this what, is what, happened. what happened. Exactly. <laughs> so the point I'm making is, is that it makes more sense because... You know, the label's just confused. We have the eat more, eat less policy in the United States that came out after the McGovern report, which basically is when we're going to say something good about food from a government perspective, eat more fruits, eat more vegetables. If it's something that's bad, we're not allowed to name the food. Eat less saturated fat, eat less oils, eat less refined sugars. We're not allowed to say the food. And from a government policy level, that's really what we do. And that's what happens in the messaging to the public. And you look at all across the agencies, they all use that Do you know messaging. why that is? What was Because the they devastated the beef industry when they said don't eat red meat. And to this day, everybody says red meat, and there's really not that much difference between any of the meats. They're all right about the same. We're all animals. Now, if you, if you report the calories per weight, yes. I mean, I'm sorry, the fat per weight, it's the same. But if you report fat per calorie on all the different cuts of meat, we're all between... 25, 30 percent. We're all really, there's no lean meat. They're all about the same. I mean, they're very, very close. Mm. And so that, you know, again, we have 26, 27 National Institutes of Health, but, but, but nutrition is controlled by the USDA. 
do we need to say anymore? I, I left NASA because I knew they weren't getting us into space. You know, that wasn't going to happen. NASA is a great organization, a lot of smart people there, everybody wants to do stuff. But in a mature bureaucracy, there's a rule against everything. So getting back to our stuff, what I'm saying is that if we would change the language and talk about food, like all the things that you talk about on some of your, your videos that you do, the short videos, you know, like your smoothie or whatever, yet you're talking about what's in it, but you're always putting foods in there. You know, I don't see you dumping powder in anything you're doing. And I don't either. I know we've talked about this that, that night we talked. So if we started with a whole food diet and we say, okay, we got a whole food diet. Now, how much do I need to meet my minimum energy needs? I meet it. If I'm active, I'm going to have to eat more. If you're in the baby, you know, producing time and that's what you guys are trying to get pregnant, you're going to have to definitely eat a, a different diet. But then how do we deal with that whole meal frequency and eat it in a small window to address this fasting? Or do we need to go a couple of days? You know, I, I mean, I don't think anybody can answer those questions. Well, right that's now. what I was wanting to get to with the, um, the, the, what time frame do you need to fast to get specific benefits? And the specific right. benefits that I really am interested in is the increase in autophagy, which then increases hematopoiesis, you know, these processes are very important for, mm -hmm. you know, long-term health and something that I'd like to right. sort of, you know, tap into. Right. And from Walter uh, Longo's research at UCLA, at least in animals and mice, he's shown that it, that it takes 48 hours of intermittent fasting to activate that whole autophagy system robustly right. and to increase metaphoresis. Right. So, so now, you know, whether or not that's applicable to humans or right. if there's, you know, I don't know, and I'm trying to add, get in contact with him to figure that out right. because uh, I'd like to know. I'd right. like to know, do I need to do incorporate 48-hour fast to, to get those autophagy you know, but, benefits yeah. that I want? And this is my goal post, um, post book. I get my book out there just because I want to get sort of the language changed, how we're talking about food, to be able to get more people like us that can extract the social paradigm, which is... You know, I don't care if you think what I'm doing is radical. It's not biologically extreme, and there's a lot of different benefits. And studies that are starting to be, I need, I want to see studies that are that are done that don't use the template of three meals a day. You're going into starvation mode. We got to make sure you get every single thing. You know, we we got shut down by an IRB. It was embarrassing. But we got shut down by RB, I won't say where, uh, to do for me to eat potatoes for two weeks in a, in, a, in a metabolic lab because the RB said it wouldn't be nutritionally sound. Based off of? Nothing. <laughs> okay, now, never mind, I had a better calorimeter than this major Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. Their IRB didn't want me to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we were going to do some full comprehensive blood work, something that we could at least write up as a case, something that could be a, a, a seed to get some funding. But that's how polluted it all is. It really is. And you talk to your average dietitian, and now the protein, carb, fat, I mean, it just becomes just jabberwocky. I personally just want to like figure out the best diet that, what what I can do right now to extend my health span. Absolutely. and and. Right now, I've been turning to, you know, what's what what's known. I've been looking at these, you know, super centenarians, which I know these people. There's there are you know right. individuals out there that are 115 years old and are cognizant yeah. and are healthy and are right. you know still active. They're not like just crippled and you know. And so I want to look at these individuals and understand what is it about their genetics. You know, because we know that things right. like intermittent fasting, dietary restriction, we know that hormesis, different plant compounds, you know, that are that are present in a variety of plants can activate yep. a variety of genes that may be activated in these individuals. We know, right. for example, FOXO3 is one that's yep. well known to be associated with. And that's you know, Luigi Fontana. I mean, they're, they're, he's right, big exactly. Fonto. And so, you know, what what can we do? with our diet, with our lifestyle that can activate these different pathways to, to help us live uh, to be longer. But to get on that, to sort of on that note. Um, so temperature. Yes. Cold. So temperature. So, so this Tell me about idea. Wim, first of all. So tell, I know you've, I know oh, you interviewed fun. him, but tell me, tell me your whole thing. Isn't he an amazing he is, man? He is full of uh, energy and passion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, um, we had a really fun time. Yeah, a couple of years ago I went over for, and we spent a week together just to get, before everything was on the rush, he was like in the what he was he going to do next phase and 
And uh, we just spent every day just talking all day and and at night laying in that we were laying in beds and we we're in the same room. We we're just having these conversations. Felt like you know in camp when you were kids, you know, and you're laying there in the dark talking about stuff, yeah. hearing all these stories. Um, and what was really fun about the whole thing is uh, is that uh, as I was, uh, you know, I, I went out and I usually carry just uh, the gloves. I use these the AG gloves. Uh, they're so they're really A gloves, but. They have silver on them because you can use your iPhone, and they're just little cotton gloves. And I use these little um, ear bags. And if I have those, if I cover those two symptoms up, I can tolerate cold really well. So I have my gloves on, and I'm out walking, you know. And Where are you guys? We're, we're in Amsterdam. Amsterdam. So we're just in, in walking winter, to the grocery store. Yeah, yeah, it's like okay. February, and we're okay. walking to the grocery store, and uh, uh, we walk down and he, he walked down and, you know, he wants to like strip down and get in the, in the water cold. <laughs> He's just this way. It's just fun. We, we had a great time. So no, anyway, we're, we basically, so we're, we're walking back and, uh, you know, he's looking, he goes, oh, hi. And that thick actually said, look at this. The ice man has a coat and you have a short sleeve shirt. <laughs> he said, this looks crazy. So then like he took his jacket. He said, I need to, kill. and then when he got home, he opened all the windows. He said, you know, I've been trapped in this apartment all, all, all summer. But what, it was really interesting that, you know, people think of him and you see this, people think of him extreme. And what Wim's actually trying to say is not extreme. He's saying humans can do this. Mm -hmm. We can't, a normal human can do it. This is what I'm saying now about fasting. A normal human, I'm not superhuman to go without food. This is normal and normal humans experience it. And what's interesting is just like this time with that and what we have in our metabolic winter hypothesis paper is this, you know, the fact that these two traits, cold stress and dietary restriction, hit the same genes, hit the same UCP1, hit the same uh, uh, PGC1 alpha, you know? So, so. Um, there's overlap, yeah. Yeah, there's overlap. And, you know, that winter never comes. There's never a time of cold stress. There's never a time of, of, uh, of dietary restriction, scarcity. Uh, and, uh, and we're in chronically, a chronically lighted environment because of modern light. So, so if we think about this, you know, the idea unfortunately gets, you know, the cryotherapy and, you know, I gotta be, and it's all gets sold as extreme, but what you found like in your sauna thing, you know, and I, I don't know if you've talked about it on another blog or whatever, but the idea that suddenly you get this amazing sleep. Like amazing well, sleep. Well, I didn't. So recently, I had this experience where I had um, done some very extreme contrast temperature contrast therapy, where I was in, sitting in a very hot sauna. Um, at its at its peak, it was 220 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very hot. And then transitioning once, I mean, I was I was bearing the pain. I was sitting in this hot sauna, you know, and 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 really pushing it. Like I wanted to get out, but I stayed in. And then finally got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to get out. And then I went straight into a, a ice bath, mm -hmm. um, a very cold ice bath. I mean, it was right. just lots of ice. Um, and that was also very difficult because it was cold. Um, <laughs> so I was going from like hot as hell to like really cold. Um, and that was the first time I've ever did you, done did, that. Did you notice that your the pain sensation on both sides was the same? Yeah, it was burning. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. We <laughs> so, only have one sense. Uh, well, it's well, what's interesting. Um, we can. I, I met with this. Um, okay, well, let me get to the sleep thing. I'm gonna get sidetracked yeah. like I always yeah. do. But <laughs> so, so I did this like four rounds, and I had a variety. I mean, I noticed that I felt really good, really relaxed. You know, there's lots of things going on in the brain, and I've done the sauna for years, and the sauna also makes me feel really good. And I've talked about some of the mechanisms by why that why that occurs. But the way I felt with the contrast therapy was a little different. Um, I felt uh, extremely um, just very relaxed and very, very happy and pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done cryotherapy, and cryotherapy also, uh, where I was sitting, uh, standing in this chamber with right. liquid nitrogen. I also felt really good like after doing that for two or three minutes. I forgot how yeah. long I did it for, but I got out, and I felt good. And I know that's, you know, norepinephrine's being released. It's been shown with cryo and cold water immersion. Um, but anyways, back to the contrast therapy. The thing that was so surprising to me was the fact that it completely reset both mine and Dan's circadian rhythm, where usually, like, him more than me, um, we're kind of night people, like, where it's like, oh, I could, I'd go to bed before midnight, but he struggles to go to bed before midnight. Hmm. And so it, we were by, at 9.30 p.m., 
so we did this in the evening. So we started like around 6 p.m., I think. Uh, and But by 9.30 p.m., we were in bed and asleep by 10. And then we woke up the next morning at 7.30. Right. And that is not you, our typical schedule and certainly not his typical right. schedule. Uh, and and that was very surprising to me, the, the contrast therapy, resetting my circadian right. rhythm. So, so one of the things you asked earlier about cold stress and weight loss for the people I work with, that's actually one of the things I do. I want them to get a lot of sleep. So I talk... I, I have sort of a, more of a metaphor, I guess, to use to sort of simplify things. But metabolic winter, I think, of dark, cool, um, still, and scarce. Mm -hmm. Metabolic summer is bright, warm, active, mm -hmm. and abundant. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, one of the things that I want them to do is get a lot of rest. Like you know, seasonal affective disorder. You know, is it a dysfunction or is it a feature? Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you don't have a lot of food, it's really not. Worth it. The idea that we're running through, you know, with spears and getting stuff is, you know, a bunch of, you know, cartoon stuff. You know, I mean, the idea was we just did, we would bunk, hunker down, we would wait, you know. And interestingly, the first, the first plants that we see, the first green that comes up through the ground, are all attached to bulbs, starch, underground storage organs, which is kind of an interesting, easy way to find them. Um, but, uh, but the contrast therapy. So I have them do ten seconds of warm, twenty seconds of cold. I have them repeat that 10 times and then end on cold. Now, at first, it this is sucks. A shower? Yeah, this is a contrast shower. And it sucks at first. How but, hot is the water? Like? Um, just your, you just, just need to warm, get warm, warm right? Okay. So, so you, you get, uh, either the, you know, get either a uh, gym boss timer or get the app on your phone okay. and set it up for it like a tap to would be, you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and repeat 10 times, end on cold. So, so 10 seconds warm, 20 seconds cold, right, because, end on cold. Because, and Wim and I, did, we developed this literally in his apartment. We were talking because we were talking about the benefits and, and we were talking about the saunas. We were talking about that. But the, you know, what could we do in, a, in, a, in a, a concise amount of time that would get us, get us going? Well, as a complete side, complete coincidence, just like you, I was I was doing something. I don't know. We are whatever. It was late, and I was still going. My mind was still going, and I went and did that, and I realized, you know, I'm really getting sleepy. And so then I started repeating, and it's like, wow, I get sleepy really fast. I may hit the bed, and I go go to sleep really quick. So um, at first, because our you know our skin can't sense absolute temperature, we sense uh, differences. In fact, you know, Wim did the little finger one little finger test, and they made him with ice water pass out. Which is kind of funny because he was, he said, you know, when the ice man passes, I <laughs> submerge my body in ice and they did this little test. And there's this strong, I don't know what the, I haven't looked up, but that there's a, some strong react, some, some, something they do with your hand and it has a strong response and it can make people pass out. So anyway, uh, but, but the point is, is that this, our bodies sense differences. You know, I wrote a blog about this on mine. It's called Chich Changes. And, and the body really, like, if you're out working in the fall, you know, when you go out, it's cool, and you start raking the leaves, or you start doing something physical, and then you take off layers, and now you're cool, now you're fine, or whatever, and then you walk in the house, ah, it feels hot, right? And you say, oh, it feels hot in here, and everybody else says it feels normal in here, yeah. you know? And you're turning down the thermostat, and vice versa, you know, walking. So we we sense these changes, and so what we tried to do is 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 make it practical where we can do it. And what I found uh, with the with with myself and with you know hundred or so people I work with is that doing it in the morning just lights you up like a Christmas tree. You just feel ready to go. You get out and go, whoo, you know, you're, you're ready to go. Not a cold shower, but the cool the and then there. And you can go as cold as you want. You, you, don't ha you have to have a big contrast. At first, you might not go as far, but eventually you're going to go full cold because it's not, I mean, it's like 50, 55 degrees. You can handle it. Um, everybody has a part, their belly, their back, their face. Something about them really makes them like, uh, you know, mm. tighten up. But you'll figure that out and... What's paradoxical about it, and I saw this on my blog and people reporting back, this is all a couple of years ago, was that you start tolerating heat better too. And it was kind of weird. You start sweating less. You start, your body starts getting sort of more adapted to this contrast so that when you go from one environment to the other, you just doesn't seem to be as much as stress, which means when you go out walking, when you go outside, I always have people do the reverse of skiing. So instead of layering and taking them off as the day goes on, I say carry it with you and only put it on if you really need it. You know, cover your symptoms first. You know, we don't get frostbite, you know, of the, of, of the head. We get it of the nose, 
ears, toes, fingers, the extremities, right? Vasoconstriction happens, and when vasoconstriction happens, we start losing the circulation as it's cold. But if you cover those symptoms first, and that was my very first experiment I did for the, before the first weight loss, was like, why am I cold? And just sitting out on my back porch with a notebook, trying to say, okay, how do I stay out here until I can't stay out here anymore? What makes me go back? And what I found was my ears and face will send me into, I can't stand it anymore, way more than my body. So back to the contrast showers, what do, doing this contrast does is it slowly elevates your tolerance for cold. Like right now I have zero cold tolerance because of the fast. Mm -hmm. Like and I opened my windows last night um, and, and it's, you know, even at 66 degrees, which my house is normally even colder than that, it starts feeling really cool, you know. And so, so um, you know, that's just a temporary thing. And last time it took about a month and a half or something to where my normal cold tolerance came out. I know it pretty well. But as you do this contrast therapy and you end on that cold for two minutes, again, in the morning it gets you alert. And at night, because of the, I think you're, where you are in your circadian day, it, it makes you uh, sleep. And I did the same thing in Australia that you did for in terms of reset. And I tried it. Now, I didn't get completely over jet lag, so it wasn't really mm -hmm. a complete success. But I used a combination of melatonin and those monocold stress and light, you know. Um, and it still took a day or two. It was worse coming back um, for me. It was much worse coming back. And um, I didn't completely fix it. So there obviously is a time function that we sort of can't avoid. But I think something as simple as that has benefit. Yeah, I'm definitely going to try to dig into uh, some of the mechanisms there because it's uh, and it's hard to find, but I'm I'm planning on trying to yeah, understand and there's, it just because it's, it was profound there, for me. And there's really good data. Um, I'll, I'll maybe I can find a, a Dropbox folder and send you Please a whole send set me of anything, links. Yeah. But like um, on um, clinic uh, clinical clinically depressed patients, mm -hmm. they were doing five minute cold showers with 60 degrees F, and um, and they were having as good as in, as good of results with medications, yeah. with their depression. Please send me that because yeah. I've been uh, theorizing that that would be the case based on the fact that cold, if you're, if you're I think it's around um, 60, anything below 62 or 63 degrees Fahrenheit, 17 yeah. degrees Celsius, whatever yeah, so, that is. So, so yeah, it increases norepinephrine. Right, and so, that's, so mild gold stress, when I talk to people, first of all, I really, I don't think people really need to be doing ice stuff right now. I mean, it's just, there's way more risk um, and you can get a lot of benefits above it. So what I always tell people, because I think everybody goes to the extreme and the fitness industry is the worst about this, but basically the, the guidelines I give to people is this, is that um, mild cold stress begins at 80 F in water, okay? And it uh, begins at 60 F in air. So, so that's about where the, that's where you start seeing a change. You start seeing a metabolic response. You start seeing a hormonal, uh, hormonal response um, at about those temperatures. Um, water is really easy to deal with all the way down to 60 F. When you get a little bit below that, it starts hypothermia. And walking hypothermia is a real problem. And you can become hypothermic and not really know it because that shivering response shuts down and you go into your non-shivering thermogenesis and yes, you boost up, you can get three to 500% increase in metabolic rate right. and you can measure this, which I, I can show you some stuff later that you can actually measure it. Uh, and a shift in respiratory quotient towards what we want to do, which is fat burn. But it also, the risk of injuring yourself goes up greatly. So my caution to everybody is, is to play in the mall places first and then go down. With air, if you're Can you above, send me the studies yeah. on the risk of yeah. uh, injury as well? Because I Well, you... hypothermia is all over the place. There, there's basically a chart. But if you look at the chart, and I'll show you what it is. If, if you just put water in hypothermia, you can get a chart and there's an exposure time. Now, obviously, I can exceed that by far. And WIM can exceed it by far. Yeah. You can train yourself to do it. What I'm saying is you get the person out there, they get all excited, and they start extreme, and then they wind up having a problem. So, um, so and... The air one is below 32. Below 32, you start having a, a bigger risk. So if you if you work in the range of that of 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 60 to 32, or 60 to 80, you pretty much for a normal person you're going to do do just fine. Now for swimming, because one of the things I want to do, this is the last time I remember doing weight loss stuff. I'm done with this forever. So I'm actually going to start exercising again. I haven't exercised for five years now, only cold stress. Yeah, so, so all of this kept 
even after five years. You know, all my muscles actually shrunk down, which is kind of weird to look because the volume of water leaves your muscles when you're fasting. It really freaked me out last time. I was like, I was just sure that I was just atrophying like crazy. I was really, like, I really screwed this one up. But when I got back to the DEXA scans, as soon as you start eating and getting minerals in your diet again, sodium and other stuff, the water comes back up. Okay. You know, so like for example, when you pump up in a gym, you're not adding protein or amino yeah. acids, you're just adding fluid. So anyway, but my point is, is that I, I, I stayed fit, I, I kept muscular, I, and I did it all through cold stress. I just did cold okay, stress. Okay, so what was your protocol? So the contrast shower water is one of them. Okay. Um, I also have a eight by 16 swim spa that I put in my backyard, and I have 110,000 B2 heat pump on it. So I can take it to 45F, all the way up to a hot tub. My kids love it, you know, they yeah. have their kids over, have a party, it's all 102, you know, whatever. Um, and so a regular cold exposure in there, and I would just lounge. I mean, I, you know, for example. Shoulders at, under? Right, right, up to the face. In fact, I did, uh, I did a thing with Stephen Leckhardt from Wired. When he came, we did all kinds. I've got great data from him, but we did um, feet, uh, I think knees, waist, shoulder, and head, when, where he was always oh. submerged. So I was doing metabolic rate the whole time. Um, what temperature was the water? Uh, 60. I did them at 60. I did them at 70. I did them at 80. So um, And those were essentially the same between right. all three temperatures? And, no, there was some differences. Okay. And then also I did, um, and a lot of this is on a blog. Uh, I think it's called, um, uh, what did I call it? Um, it's, it's, if, you, if they just go to the metabolism tag, I came up with some, some stupid name for it, but it's something meta metabolism, mastering metabolism or something. Anyway, it, I, I do it in the third part. I talk about Stephen's results, and down in the comments section, I posted even more data because people became interested. I don't, I don't want to put too of it, much of it up there just because it gets boring. But, uh, but the swimming, getting back to swimming. I want to take up swimming. I know I've always been able to swim, so I've never been afraid of water. I scuba dived. I was a water skier. I love swimming, but I never learned to like swim laps, you know. And and you know, I really want that graceful to be able to swim. Swimming is the only exercise you can start at any age, at any level of fitness, and you can do it to the end of your life. So I want to introduce. And what's interesting about resistive swimming, which means if you're swimming on a tether. Um, and you're swimming in a swim spa or a tether in a pool where you just have a mount. So you have a, like a fiberglass rod and a, and a, and a rope that goes to a, 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 la a band. When you're swimming, you're really, it's really you know, glide left, glide right. You know, you're basically cutting through the water. It's not really a power move. You know, it's, it's really about the hydrodynamics of the water streaming over you. you know? uh, but when you're swimming on a tether and you're not moving, it's like slogging through water. Mm. So it's actually physically more difficult to swim on a tether. It's the same activity, the same feel, but when you move, you start moving that fiberglass rod and you start bending it down some, and if you let off a little bit, you start going back. So you actually, it becomes, even swimmers, really good swimmers have told me, I had you know Olympic athlete in my pool, and, and she said, you know, it really definitely gives you a workout if you want the workout part. But what's really amazing about Stephen's data is that when he got out of the water, instead of doing what everybody does and jumping in the sauna, we just had him sitting there and we were measuring his metabolism the whole time. And his respiratory quotient went from 1.0, which is most activities are burning glycogen, whoosh, almost to 0.7, almost pure fat. And for over an hour, he was still burning fat. And, and that's after what temperature being? And that born? was uh, that, that was 70. seventy. So, for swimming, the optimal temperature of comfort and impact is about seventy five F. With all the stuff I've looked at, not, not studies, but stuff I've looked at in my pool, right around there, it's not too much of a shot. Now, seventy degree water for someone who lives on the west coast, they're like, what? You right, know, right, <laughs> that's right. What right. I'm thinking. I you know, if like you this. live in the south, you know, it's you know, the Gulf in Mexico, it's like eighty or in the tropics. Um, uh, and down at 60, it starts becoming something, right? So what do you mean by becoming something? Like your metabolism it, really well, speeds no, up? You're, you're really you're no, you're fat. still going to burn carbohydrate as long as you're really active. And if you're shivering, you're burning carbohydrate. You're not burning fat, really? right? Shivering is exercise. So here's what we know. We talk about this a little bit in the metabolic winter hypothesis, which is, you know, 
I believe exercise is mimicking cold stress. I believe most of the benefits we're seeing, because here's what happens. If I have people exercising and they start to shiver, I'm sorry, I start exercising, um, not shivering, they start to exercise, they produce irisin. Irisin is known to upregulate and create more brown adipose tissue. And we've seen this happen, there's, there's these studies, and it's come out in the last three years or four years. Well, what's shivering? Shivering is original, original exercise. I mean, we don't really have to go do something at a gym. I'm not talking about people that want to look better. I, I have no problem with people having it as a sport or a compete competition or whatever. I'm, our conversation is in the silo of longevity and healthfulness. You know, this is metabolic. So the first step of, 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 the first step of cold stress is that I'm shivering. Now, this is a very energetically expensive way to produce heat. Why? Because now... You know, 20% of it is being used to move the muscles and do that. So then what happens? A little bit later, shivering stops, non-shivering thermogenesis kicks in, upregulation happens with UCP1. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just using, you know, proton, electron leaks through the mitochondria and suddenly I'm not producing ATP, I'm just producing 100% heat. What's the cell using to do that? It's, it's grabbing the most energy-dense fuel and it's using lipids mm-hmm. to do it. So that's a real good adaptive strategy because if you were keeping warm using glycogen, you'd run out very quickly. Or if, you're using, if you were using it and it was coming from gluconeogenesis, you would run out really quickly. So what's interesting is, is that if you think of exercise as a way that we mimic mild cold stress in the past or periods of mild cold stress, a lot of the benefits might actually be the same. Yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of uh, overlapping benefits, like the brown adipose tissue, PGC1 alpha, the increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. You know, yeah. all these the right. fat, fat they, oxidation. They all over overlap. Yeah, but and there s- are absolutely um, important benefits from exercise. Like study, just I was reading today about on the brain how it's like doing aerobic exercise in midlife for a mouse, like prevented the blood brain barrier from breaking down, prevented. Uh, decrease the amount of activated microglia. Right. All you know, so there's a lot of um, other benefits from exercise right. that well, are the, not related. The, the point here is, and, and that's the, 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 the this is about changing our, our our conversation because it it almost is impossible to talk about something other than exercise without someone saying yes, but yes, but exercise. Forget that. We all know there's benefits to exercise. Let's just put that aside for a second. And let's say, okay, what specifically might be going on? You know, what specifically? You know, the same people probably didn't study the same people that were mild cold stress. And maybe some of those same benefits can happen with that. So all I'm saying is, is that it's possible. Mm -hmm. You can't prove right here, but it's possible that a lot of these benefits of this excess moving, because in nature, all organisms are concerned conserve or are they they conserve they live a, con, a a conserved life we want to think of them being all active and they're all on the hunt and they're more active us and we live a sedentary access a, a lifestyle but the opposite of sedentary is an exercise the opposite of sedentary is active and i didn't say i wasn't active i didn't say i never got on a bike mm-hmm. i just didn't change clothes to do it i didn't say i didn't ever go out with the kids for a walk i didn't say that we don't go i'm a skateboarder so i didn't say we didn't go skate longboarding i just said i didn't change i don't I didn't count it. I didn't. I didn't write it down. I didn't do you're it. You're not going to a gym, you're right? Not like, so, you're so, not, so it's, what yeah. I'm trying to say disruptively is: wait, let's stop talking about exercise for a minute because this all got started around 1911. Well, between 1900 and 1911, McFadden was the first one. I'll show you the books in the room where all this got together, and the link of diet and exercise happened primarily through the calorie. Now, we've since learned there's a lot of benefit, but the vast majority of people think it's Energy, I'm outputting energy and I'm inputting energy and I'm trying to maintain that balance. And that's really not the way I'm thinking of exercise. I'm thinking of exercise the way we think of food differently. See, we're on the same side of that. And I'm saying that there are things that exercise does that might likely mimic cold stress because exactly the same thing happens. It doesn't make sense for the body to create uh, irisin that creates a tissue that burns fuel and just creates waste heat, unless it had, unless it was more energetically do it. If it was more energetically to to get up and move, to create the waste heat, to go get something, 
that would have probably been the pathway. I'm saying there's a good argument to be made that maybe the benefits are that we um, evolved those sets of cold, cold stress responses that happen to mimic the dietary restriction stock as a survival mechanism for winter, and we've just, en extra, we've just engineered winter out of our life in the last century. We do have temperature controlled environments. Right, are, right. You know, and I, I think that both temperature extremes are important. And it may, you know, if you're living somewhere like in the South, it's hot as hell in the summer right. and the winter is cold, right. you know, maybe that's the way it's supposed right. to be. Maybe your body's supposed right. to be shocked by the heat and shocked right. by the cold. Right. But instead, we come into these heat and air conditioned houses yes. and, yes. and, you know. And, and, what you, and what you said when we were talking to the party, you know, when we're sort of making our, our little mind melt implosion in the center of the room, right? You know, I think we sort of forgot everybody was there. We were doing, but the heat shock proteins, they're very right. similar to the cold shock. So, so the point I'm saying is if we could just entertain the thought, you know, Aristotle said it's a mark of the educated mind to, uh, cons you know, to uh, consider the, uh, entertain the thought without embracing it. And I'm saying, let's put exercise aside for a second, just like I'm saying, as soon as I start talking about calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, fasting, immediately the, the dietitians go, yeah, but you gotta have balance, you can't be deficient. It's like, okay, we understand that that's there. We don't wanna talk about deficient. We're not talking about deficiency, but they don't even know a concept. They don't even know an idea behind how a person would possibly even live. They think you die in days without nutrition. They just, they do, and you know it's, it's funny, right? Uh, and and yet I'm having a you know this is a pretty challenging conversation. I have to it's ask today, you a question. Go ahead. Wait, on your 21 day fast, like so, like what happened to your bowel movements? Like, they stop. I still have my one. When like how long? Uh, the last one I had was uh, Monday at a 7-Eleven on October the 12th. And today's November 3rd. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, that's you pretty, just don't have. That's that. pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. You don't have valve movements. Can you no, please do a U biome? Like I want to. Oh, you I didn't know, do it damn before. Damn it! I know. I oh, I wanted Ray, to. What's wrong I know. with you? I just had oh. so much to get. I just had so yeah. much other. I mean, it's, that would have been all so the blood work I did was so expensive, and you know, I've 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 used really donation on my blog. I you know, there's plenty of opportunities to do this again. You're absolutely, I should have done it. I should have done it. And the last time there were, the nitrogen, I forgot to do nitrogen. You didn't do nitrogen. I didn't do nitrogen the last time. I had Dexa, so this time I did nitrogen. So I have that. But anyway, getting back to cold stress. Yes. And I, the point I'm making is, is that this is what I mean about change in dialogue. And what I'm trying to do in in, in my book, Our Broken Plate, is is talk about how we can separate things. I got a chapter on exercises. Look, okay, I'm starting this off. Exercise has a lot of benefits. Okay, did we get that over with? Okay, I don't wanna talk about that anymore. You know, I wanna talk about where exercise overlaps with these really cool, really pun intended, I guess, cool things in our biology that are connected with longevity. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and it's like extreme. Okay, I know we can live in extreme environments and we can deal with all extreme stuff, but quite frankly, I don't have this testosterone rush. I don't have to beat my chest and say, you know, I'm the he-man with the abs. I, I just really, really care when I want to live long. You know, they can have the abs, whatever they want. So the point I'm making is what I want to do is look at this cold stress and say, okay, look, here are all the things that we know are upregulated. Here are all the things that happen. Yes, they have an overlap with exercise, and then over here we got nutrition, and there are things that we need to be nourished with and things we don't want to be deficient in, but here's where we have dietary restriction. And I think that something can be put together. And then you add the third part of the trichotomy, which is sleep. Right. It's clearly sleep, sleep is beneficial for both of those. So, you know, if we look at this little trichotomy as sleep, uh, you know, cold stress and, and, and dietary restriction, to me, that's the axis we start with. And then the exercise, again, just like we talked about with starches and, uh, starches and sugars earlier with the studies, all the exercise stuff, is a lot of it is done on people that are living in a normal world. So if it makes you better in a normal, normally overfed, overnourished, kind of world, that doesn't mean people that have actually are approaching diets, like you and I care about our diets and we're approaching something, at least the best we can figure out, approaching something that's optimal, um, if it's necessarily gonna have the same benefits as us. It might drive over nutrition.
Because there is a feedback loop. There is a point. There is a tipping point. I'm just point. in my head thinking there may be a temporal effect too because I just now am recalling a study. So this animal study I just told you that was just published in Fast Sub Journal, I believe. Um, maybe it was PLOS. It's one of the, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember which journal, but it was published like today um, where they showed that in midlife, you know, aerobic right. exercise had all these p- positive effects on the brain, delayed, you know, markers of Alzheimer's and all this stuff. There's another study that was published about last year in Nature. Um, that showed that cold stress, mild, um, it was mild cold stress. Actually, mm-hmm. it was more than mild because it, yeah. it was more like <laughs> like sit, like standing in a refrigerator for 30 minutes. So right, right, cold. every two hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it showed that um, it had that mild cold stress pr- protected against um, I- Alzheimer's disease in animal models that were um, genetically engineered to get Alzheimer's, right. human Alzheimer's. Right. It showed that it protected against it, but only if the cold stress was done in early life. Mm-hmm. So if it, cold stress was done. In midlife and not in early life, it had no protective effect. So it's right. kind of weird, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. But right. um, I do want to ask you on the on the cold stress. I, I would be interested in seeing studies to see if there's synergistic effects on the brain. I'm also very interested in the brain and the, and the effects oh, of exercise. Most on the brain. of the work that I did on cold stress, because where I was in that point in in my life was I was really look, I didn't understand calories, and so I was really trying to understand how can we maximize calorie burn. I really believed the goal at that time was to create more metabolic output. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I hadn't quite found that I can control weight and everything perfectly with the dietary input. It's actually pretty trivial. So now that my goal has flipped, so a lot of the things that I know about this are ancillary to what I was looking at at the time, but I've aggregated a lot of 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 studies on that. Yeah. So, so just, it's a great, it would be a great data dump. When we, when we go back, I'll, I've got a lot of them. Unfortunately, I have to have paper right. when I'm reading a paper. Yeah, I can't yeah. do it online. I can't do it electronically. Maybe with the new iPad. Some people are physical, like you remember things well, by physical. It was just because I did it that way for so long. I always had notebooks. I always mm-hmm. had, I always wrote whatever. Maybe with the new, you know, the new uh, iPad Pro, whatever is big enough and I can write on the paper. Right. Maybe that'll give me enough tactile uh, input that I can do it. So the downside is I've got all these PDFs that are lost in Mendeley. Uh, the the upside is is that um, is is that um, there I have the I have the I have a lot of them organized because of our paper. I have a lot of them more in one, one place, and we can just do data, data bump. But I wasn't looking at what you were looking at. That's that's right. the point. But I want to ask you about the um, like a protocol. Like say someone that wants to try to you know increase some of their brown adipose tissue. They want to uh, ramp up their fat oxidation using mild cold stress. Is there is there some sort of general protocol where you say you know spend in addition to your contrast therapy that you mentioned you know you spend twenty minutes in sixty degree water or or something like that. Is there something that you yeah, think they, would work? I, 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 it's on my website. I actually have the data right there. You can see it. I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't burn a significant amount of fat. That's the the, the downside. Okay. So you're not going to really the weight loss is is minimal. Uh, it's it 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 is a, it it does in addition to dietary mm. restriction, but you have to have some kind of deficit to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely shifts your RQ. And um, what I have seen is that you know generally speaking, after you know a few weeks of cold stress and doing um, doing restrictive diet, where you're just running at a chronic deficit. You're going to see your RQ shift more towards 0.7, more it lowers. It goes more towards fat burning. You know, you can get yourself easily into a mode where you're about 75% of your your day is is fat is burning uh, uh, fat or metabolizing fat if you keep your activity low. As soon as you start doing things that raise your activity, your your um, uh, respiratory quotient starts going back up, and then you're on the glycogen tre- treadmill, which is why all these people want to get into ketogenic because they want to short this, change the system. But I'm talking about you know something that also benefits the microbiome, et cetera. And if I if I do that lifestyle, then the microbiome it's like pushing a bubble on a bumper sticker. You know they're just pushing the problem around, but nobody's worried about the microbiome, and that ends up being I think like we said earlier, that's actually the most important place. That's where we need to start. Gut health, feeding yeah. it, and making sure we get that. But shifting it over to fat, you absolutely can with cold stress. Um, most people just don't have access to cold water. You know? What about just sitting in a cold bathtub? Like if you just put cold um, water? In yeah, the- I think that, I, again, what I do when I'm skiing, for example, 
is because uh, since I was skiing every year, but I wasn't doing any activity or any training before it. Right. So normally what that would mean is like on the second or third day, you would just be fatigued and your legs were wasted like noodles. Right. Everybody would think yet yeah. never happened to me. And the reason why is as soon as I come off the slopes, I go into the into the bathroom. I do a contrast shower and I'm cold. And then I fill the bathtub's already filled up with cold water as cold as it'll come out of the tap. Just sit up to my waistline uh, in cold water and all of that leaves and you feel when you get out, you almost feel as if you could go run or do anything again right then. It just, it just does that. So that's like a little simple strategy that I use for that. Um, I, I move past the calorie thing because in order to do the calorie balance, I needed to understand food. And so then when I got the calorimeter, yeah, I did some things with Steven on, on activity. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, it's all the food. It's the food. It's the food. Because no matter what I was doing, the numbers that I met, when you're really measuring your, your calories and you're really seeing exactly how much fat and carbohydrate you did in this session, and it's like you're not, you can't hide from it. And it's like over and over, I'm like, wait a minute. It's the food. So that got me off on the last mm. four-year rabbit chase to figure out how did our relationship with food break. So, you know, to not answer your question, but to address it at least, to say is that, I don't think I have it at that granularity. And I think there, to me, where I am now, my interest is, is really in how much cold stress do we need to activate these things? I want, that's where I wanted to go next with it. Next with, just like we were talking about earlier with crowdfunding and potentially doing stuff with dietary intervention that, that we can measure these biomarkers, okay, then with and without cold stress, you know? Um, I live chronically in cold stress in the winter, so I let my temperature fluctuate with the outside. I don't, my heat is set maybe at 50. So it goes up sometimes because the day is warm and, you know, you get whatever. Wow. Then so I at let, night it gets it's cool. cold. Yeah, and I don't sleep and I don't sleep with blankets. So At all? No. Do you have a sheet? So, no, sometimes not. Yeah, at 50 yeah. degrees? Yeah, so I can sleep. I can sleep. Now, right now I can't because of the fasting. Yeah. But um, I conditioned myself. This is one of the things I did before um, all the stuff that came out in Four Hour Body. I started with, you know, blankets, and I'm like, you know, we had blankets or we blanketed um, to because we never used to heat bedrooms. That's what blankets were for. The rest of the house was cold, and now we blanket and we heat the bedroom. So um, I started with the blanket, and I and I folded it down, and then you know you'd have it back in the morning, right? And then you fold it down. One night you wake up as ha. Huh. I didn't use the blanket tonight. You know, it was halfway. And I found that if it's just on my feet, just actually the weight on my feet, and it turns out I have enough. And, you know, a lot of my friends are astronauts. One of my friends, Scott Parasinski, and they talk about sleeping. A lot of astronauts can sleep free tethered and float. And a lot of astronauts need a tether to something because they need that feeling because mm -hmm. they just don't like the, you know, mummy free float thing. So I'm a little like that, and my feet need some kind of weight on them, and that's what I need. So then I start with a sheet the same way. Put it halfway down, sleep without it, and then and then you get it back up. And where you end up with is really an interesting place. So for me, the comfort you get from a blanket, that this is like sugar feels good and food gets good and that sort of thing, the comfort you get from a blanket is sort of this warmness, this you know, womb-like feeling. That feeling for me is between me and the bed. And when this side gets cold, I turn over and that's the warm spot. You know? But you acclimated yourself to But I acclimated. Her. Now, have you ever taken a nap on the sofa? Yes. Did you need to lose a blanket? No. You can just sleep on the sofa. I don't remember. <laughs> well, you know my point. You point yeah. Every people, like, people yeah, yeah. fall asleep on the couch right. all the time. You don't need to do all that. It's just conditioning. And so you don't just like put all your blankets off and say, I'm going to sleep without covers. That's crazy. That's just like, you know, you're, you're not going to do it. You've got to do it slowly. And there's a really simple test to see if your room is too warm or you're blank over blanketing. And that is if you stick your feet out from the covers at night or in the morning, or you have to stick your hands out. If you do those two things, that's a sign that you're sleeping with too much covers because that's a way to trick your brain into thinking you're cooler than you really are. Because hmm. we actually have to go to cool. So on to melatonin, right. which is a natural place. You know, everybody knows about melatonin reset and that sort of thing. And we can talk a little bit about the sirtuin and the, you know, that paper I sent you with the, the activation, which I think is good for the longevity stuff. But, you know, one of the roles of melatonin is to have you drop 
Core body temperature. Temperature through your extremities. You actually told me that. You're the first person that told me that when we you know, met right. a couple of months ago. And I was completely fascinated. Yeah. And I looked up the studies and I yeah. found, yeah, yeah. administering <laughs> melatonin yeah. to people does make their core body yeah. temperature drop. So, so, so what's neat is, is this is part of that got to drop the brain temperature. And what we do is we have this warm room. We get in our warm pajamas, you know, we get in our, our flannels, we put this blanket on. It's everything is antithetical to what our body's trying to do. Now, enter the contrast shower. You start out with the contrast shower, say 30 minutes or an hour or so before you're going to go to bed, right? Out of the shower, lights go off. Now I'm into the, you know, all these people walking around, blue block or blue block, whatever. Fuck, I don't do that. Just come out of there, lights go off. I have a little red light that's, my, my bed, bed light is red, and I switch to paper. All, the screens go off, and now I'm in my old books. Mm -hmm. I love to read my old books, right? Okay, 30 minutes I stay in the dark, I do, and I do about 30 milligrams of melatonin a night. That's a lot of melatonin. Yeah, it is. It's a yeah, lot of melatonin. A lot of yeah, melatonin. it is. I do about 30 milligrams a night. Um, and there's a lot of really great stuff that was done in the 90s on melatonin, the antioxidant side and the, obviously this longevity stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I don't fear it. I don't, I don't think that it's a, a bad thing. I'm doing it exactly when my body would be producing it. Let me ask you again. So the contrast shower was 10 seconds warm, 20 seconds cold. Uh, and on cold. How many times? And on cold for two Ten minutes. times. Ten times and on cold two minutes. Right? Yeah, you know, just I, I want you to get used to it because that's the conditioning this. part, right? Because yeah. I want to see right. if it right. does my circadian and, rhythm. And then, and then, out of, then dry off. Get in bed, and then at that point, it's I don't do the dark. I do dark or I do red lights. No blue, no, right? no blue light. Right, so I do that. I don't do screens, and then um, and then I wait thirty minutes, and then I do the melatonin. Now, the melatonin. now sometimes it's a problem because it used to be like after contrast showers. I told you I'd hit the pillow and I'd fall asleep in yeah. like seven minutes. You know, I mean, just be. I mean, you, you get sleepy. And I, and I find, I usually lay my melatonin, I use the fast dissolves. Mm -hmm. So I used to find them, I used to have them, you know, just laying down there ready to go. And I'd wake up in the morning, there they would still be, you know, <laughs> damn, I forgot it. Uh, but, but anyway, so the melatonin, and um, one of the things it did for me is it, it completely cured secondary insomnia. It just the contrast that uh, contrast the combination of two. Melatonin yeah, and it, and I tried time release. It never worked. I tried oh. melatonin alone. I was doing the one milligram five that did nothing. And if somebody just starts with thirty milligrams, you're going to feel hungover in the morning. So you can't just start there. Because do you know what? Have you played with melatonin? Any? I have the largest dose I've done. I usually only take melatonin um, if I am trying to get over jet lag. Right. And I've done three milligrams, or if I'm yeah, right. if I'm traveling somewhere, so, so, I can't sleep. So for a normal person doing melatonin at that point, um, if they go over the dose, the symptom is in the morning they feel groggy and they don't want to wake up. I've heard about that. Right. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, it's it's just not possible to do that. So I mean, it's just not possible to do that. But I built up over a while, and I'm getting all you know. Obviously, past forty, my melatonin's fallen off precipitously at this point. You know, that's what all the studies say. I'm doing it at the circadian time, the time when my brain would be of yeah. releasing it, probably is releasing it. Um, and I feel like at that point, I'm also, you know, I'm entering a fasted state as well, the dietary restriction. You know, you know my, my meals were earlier in the day, so I'm, I'm far past. I'm in a post-absorptive state at this point. And so I, I just feel like it's, uh, it's going to be beneficial. And then this study just came out. And unfortunately, I haven't had a time to dig into the one that I posted for you, which is the basically CERT1 and melatonin uh, and resveratrol all uh, working together. Mm -hmm. So they found a synergistic effect with melatonin, CERT1, I want to say uh, melatonin and resveratrol and CERT1. So um, again, I see this clue once again of this little trieconomy, sleep, yeah. dietary restriction, cold stress. Well, melatonin's a hormone, regulates yeah. 500 different genes. Yeah. I mean, that's two and a half percent of the human genome. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you said, it's one of the most important uh, hormones that regulates brain antioxidant activity, right? You know, and that's been those those yeah. studies have been shown. I mean, in the '90s, there were a lot of really, you know, I know there were sort of fad diet books, but they're serious researchers too. They were all publishing, you know, all the little books that are the small print that we used to come out the way diet books used to be, you know, uh, before it was big money. Yeah. <laughs> and then the color glossy stuff we see today. And you also mentioned that you know you're you're at a point in your life where your melatonin's dropping uh, exactly. precipitously, and that's. It's, you know, at least from the studies that I've seen, it like around 40 years old, yep. 
you know, your pineal gland starts to make less yep. and less serotonin. Yep. I mean, melatonin. The other interesting thing is that, you know, most of the melatonin made in the body is actually made in the gut. Gut, right, the serotonin. And so it's like, yeah, serotonin gets converted into melatonin. And my question is, what is it doing? What is it doing in the gut? Like, what is it doing in the in the circulatory system? I'm kind of interested in right. that. Like, I'd like no, to know. I, I, think, I think this is, like, this paper really made me excited because I had hypothesized this, these connections and ran them by David, and we actually, we touched on it. We, we had, because of editorial limits on that first paper, we had to sort of um, uh, walk away a little bit from the sleep part, and we mainly focused on Sucks. the other stuff. But you know what, you know what yeah. it's like. You know, it's like, okay, we got, we, we're, we're we, Too many we, words, right. they make you but trim we, it down. But basically, <laughs> but we got, we got it in there, but we had to do, we just said that people can adapt to sleeping cool. Now, these are like the Aboriginal studies that were done. These are, uh, in, I think, in the 30s or whatever, where they took literally refrigerated trucks into Australia, took the natives who, by culture, they sleep under 30 degree temperature, no covers, no blankets. They shiver all night and they get perfect REM sleep. And yet, the Caucasian, uh, you know, control, those guys were just miserable and they were horrible. And same thing with the laps. You know, the northern lap, the laps. They could learn to sleep in these cold, just on a little cot above the floor of the ice hut, hut. And they were getting amazing sleep, even though it was cold. And they weren't all blanketed, you know? So what we know is we're highly adaptable. That's the point we make into the, into the, uh, into, in the, in the, um, uh, the, in the paper. And in fact, we know that, um, you know, we've now some studies have come out in terms of metabolic rate and activity. The ones that were done in NIH with 66 degrees uh, F. People sleep better. I sleep yeah. better. Hospitals are cold, not warm, and there's a reason, you know? What, what I like to understand is, well, one, I can't sleep in, in the heat. That's, I, right. you know, I think a lot of people are like that. But what I like to understand is, you know, why core body temp core body temperature is absolutely under a circadian rhythm. Right. Obviously, you know, melatonin plays a role in that. Um, but I would, would really, I'd like to understand, like, why exactly? Right. Why is it that? Right. Why does your body being cold, cooler, make you sleep? Like, right. why? Right. You know, I'd like right. to understand the mechanism. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. And, and I'm trying and it, to figure it out. I just and, started looking into it. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's, and I mean, I think it's tied to the fact of that drop in temp half a degree that the brain needs to see. You know, that's that half degree. And, you know, it's really amazing. It's hibernation, you know? Yeah, right? yeah. They, they, you go. You get the, yeah. It's when uh, in in winter. Yeah. It's when they sleep. Yeah. And and it's and and if you think about it, um, you know, it's really amazing if you think about you know, uh, uh, you know, homeotherms versus pokeotherms. When you look at the difference in our regulatory mechanisms, and you look at how in the hell our bodies stay at this certain temperature, and you know, another big leader in the uh, in uh, in um, the thermal regulation side. That's a whole new brand, a whole nother branch of people. A really interesting colleague that I've met, and he's been amazing. Ivanov has done all this stuff on thermal regulation. And interestingly, our temperature is a result of a energy flux, and we don't actually maintain body temperature. So we're actually not maintaining 98.6. It's the net sum of what actually is going on. And, uh, and that's really kind of interesting. And he's done amazing studies. When I was doing all this stuff with the energetic side, his stuff was really, really, really incredible. Um, but, you know, it just seems like this theme comes up over and over that th these things get connected. And, yeah. you know, th and if you think about it, in the last century and... You know, that's the subtitle of my book, you know, how our mastery of, of food and environment may have led to unintentional, you know, chronic disease and, and, uh, and obesity. Super cool, Ray. Um, this has been a very uh, interesting conversation we've had. We've been, we've covered yeah. a lot. Yeah, we we've did. We've covered a lot. Yeah. Um, but the, room, if, the room didn't melt this time. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> um, if people want to learn more about, you know, the, the science you're doing, the books you're writing, the experiments you're doing, anything about Ray... Cronice, where can they find you? What, what? Uh, well, Google is easy. Just Ray Cronice. It's C R O N I S E. I guess you'll slug that. Um, right now, for a short period of time, um, when this is being this one, if you're looking later, I have a crowdsource. Uh, Our broken plate is the is the title. It's on Kickstarter. I would love your support um, to try to do this. This is sort of proof that we can sort of do this. Um, 
And, um, and then uh, my regular website is hypothermics.com, but raycronice.com points to it. Uh, I'll probably blo- be blogging a little bit less. I mean, literally, I blogged once in the last year, twice. I- I'm not one of these people that has to put something up every week just to drive traffic because I don't care. It's when I have something really to say that I put it up there. But go back and start and read, and you'll see actually where I was wrong. Because, you know, one of the things that you and I know, but a lot of people, you know, science, you're only learning when you're wrong. Right. And if, you're, if your thoughts don't evolve and if you don't change along the time, you're probably not like pushing hard enough. So you'll actually see my thinking evolve on this. And you know, some of the things we've talked about today, I go into more detail. So that site, and then sooner or later, I'll probably have a, a hour broken plate and do a little work on there. So hope to use that as a, as a, uh, as a, a focus point to try to pull together some of the philanthropy money that's thrown at all the other stuff what about social media? Are you yeah, TV? yeah. Uh, Twitter, it's at Ray Cronice. Um, I have an Instagram. I think my Instagram is Mr. Zero G. Um, you know, you can link to all those uh, YouTube channels. All and I don't. I'm not putting anything on there right now, uh, but you can link to all those on my Hypothermics awesome. page. Cool. Thanks a lot, Ray, for this. Great. Really interesting it's been fun. Session.